the moment. If you find yourself having some signal issues, you can just leave the meeting by clicking leave meeting and then come right back in by clicking join and entering the code like you did in the beginning and join us in the Zoom room. And then you're back. And now let's just join into a deep experience together. Thank you so much. Okay, well, hi, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night movie gatherings. <laughs> nice to have you here. We've got a beautiful movie in store tonight. So yeah, I'll cross it over to David. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, you can see us all. We're here. We're all nestled in for another movie night. I see there at the monastery, Camas. Yeah, I see there they are. There it is, La Casa. It's a big crowd over there at La Casa. And all around, we're all gathered in. And we're excited again to, uh, to go toward clarity on a couple themes that that people voted for over the week and I think for the first time in a while our English poll and our Spanish poll came out identical and now Paulina's joined us so maybe in coming weeks we might even have a Portuguese poll uh, but right now the both the Spanish and English polls came out the top vote getter actually by far runaway was miracle mindedness. So you asked for a miracle mindedness movie and we've got it for you. And the second place in both polls out of like four or five, six uh, different options, second place in both polls was taking back projections. So that's a good one too, taking back projections. I, I was looking at the workbook lesson uh, I think it might have been uh, very recent, maybe yesterday uh, or yesterday or today. It was, I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts. Today. It's today. I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts. And that's the kind of idea that is so helpful in releasing anger. It's so helpful in releasing resentments and grievances. I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts is that it's, that's like a, a Byron Katie turnaround in A Course in Miracles because if it's just your thoughts, then you can release those thoughts. Those are just attack thoughts. So I can be heard by nothing but my thoughts is really a later version in the workbook of lesson number 23. Uh, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. So that's really the first presentation of the idea where he gives the full presentation, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. And how we do that is we, through miracles, that's why it's called A Course in Miracles, we become more and more consistently miracle-minded, we become more in alignment with the Holy Spirit, we start to become more gentle, more meek, uh, and we grow in strength, our mind we, we recover or remember the power of the mind through our meekness, through our non-judgment, through our relinquishment of attack thoughts. And that lesson number 23, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts, it does remind me a bit of the first Matrix movie when Neo finally gets to meet Morpheus for the first time. That's my nickname. My friend Tarana in India, she always calls me Morpheus. When she came all the way from India, she's like, Morpheus, at last. Like Neo, at last. And when he meets Morpheus, Morpheus says, the matrix is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. So it's a perceptual world that's being used by the ego as a way to keep you fooled into thinking that you're in a real place, interacting with real people and real things, and to f help you forget that you can be hurt by nothing but your thoughts. If the world seems real, then it seems like 
the people are real people. It seems like the hurricanes are real hurricanes. I think there's a hurricane coming up <laughs> right now towards Mexico. Uh, yeah, it's coming. Hurricanes, typhoons, tsunamis, uh, volcanic eruptions, pandemics, all kinds of things the ego has come up with. And it's just part of a prearranged script. It's like a movie that's, it's an intricate, ingeniously designed movie to keep you from knowing who you are, to keep you from seeing it's all just your thoughts. And these aren't even your real thoughts. They're just a, a bunch of illusory thoughts that are mesmerizing, hypnotizing the mind into thinking that it's separate from God. And all of these thoughts and images come from the ego. So we are going to watch a movie tonight that will help us free our mind from the egoic belief system and the egoic thoughts. Because as long as you try to escape it as a person, and you have your faith in being a person, you will at some point discover, as in the movie Dark City, there is an inspector, a detective, who basically said, it was Inspector Walensky who said, there's no way out. I've tried everything. It's circular. It's a circular trap. So it's kind of like a hamster on the wheel. It doesn't matter how fast you pedal and paddle. You don't get out from inside the wheel. You have to get outside the wheel. And so that's what we're going to do with tonight's movie. That's really important as far as becoming miracle-minded because if you try to become miracle-minded still as a person, like personally miracle-minded, and then you get into, maybe you use things like the, the secret and manifesting, and you can create your own reality, and the power of positive thinking, and affirmations, and mantras, and there's all kinds of different things that the ego can take it and it can turn it just enough so that you don't get out of that wheel. You can seem to try to make a better illusion is what the ego will say. You're not satisfied with, with your life, make it better. And yet um, Francis and I were talking right before we came over about how ingenious this trap is of the world because um, Actually, Francis was reading the Urantia book and it was talking about the times of back around Jesus and how there was the ruling class, which we'll say basically is the Romans. Uh, the Romans might, the Roman strength of the Roman Empire, they basically are the ruling class. So Pontius Pilate and the, the rulers, the ones that are put in charge, basically they can live the best life that the world has to offer. It had nice little swimming pools and baths and have nice fruit and dancing girls and belly dancers. And you know, if you're a Roman back at the time, you know, you're gonna to try to make the best of it. And, and then there's, there's, as Francis was describing, there's layers and levels of slavery where there's many different levels that are underneath the ruling class and then all of these levels, everybody's in part of a system where they have to do whatever the rulers say. There's not many of the rulers. And then there's, there's levels of slavery, and then you could even pay, and you could, or get paid, you get paid, you can get paid as a slave. You can get a salary as a slave, which makes you feel like you're a little bit better than somebody else. And even though you're still a slave, you get paid. It's part of the ego's trick to keep you believing in the whole system. And nowadays, we have jobs and careers. It's, it's slavery, but <laughs> it's got all the perks of technology and all kinds of comforts, conveniences, gadgets, and distractions. Uh, on the internet, you know, people can access the internet now in wider and wider ways. And they say, they tell me that the pornography on the internet is like the, the big thing. Casinos, online, and pornography. They said that's the most lucrative thing. 
I think there's, I mean, if you're going to be a spiritual teacher, there's the create your own reality group where they work on manifesting and material abundance and everything. And that's a pretty sneaky uh, thing too, because you can seem to have the best of both worlds, the spiritual world and the ego's world. Oh, but Jesus says they don't meet, they don't mix. And so we were talking on the way over about, Francis was saying, well, nothing has really changed in the last 2000 years. We have a more sophisticated prison and that the ego is ingenious, so it just invents more and more sophisticated distractions and more and more sophisticated ways of keeping the mind asleep. Because if the mind wakes up, then it's game over for the ego. And that's not what the ego wants. The ego wants it game over for God. <laughs> and, and the ego is the game. So we were talking too is that one of the things that I learned, not just from reading the Course, but from watching Gandhi, from reading and watching St. Francis, Mother Teresa, uh, Ramana Maharshi, all the great saints. We showed Yogananda's movie. Was that last week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's all happening so fast. It's simultaneous. I can't even remember. Was that yesterday's lesson today? Was that Yogananda? Yeah. It's all happening simultaneously. But for me, it wasn't just picking up the course, but I was feeling moved by non-possession, by non-control, by no ownership, by why don't we share everything? Why is it so difficult to share and share everything? You know, even when I would would travel around and people would take me into their homes, I would I would kind of marvel at all when I was traveling at all the different houses, all the different cars that each house had its own set of silverware, its own couches, its own beds, its own cars, and its own light fixtures and fans and everything. And I was like, wow, it, everybody has their own. They're like, yeah, that's the way it is on this planet. Everybody has their own. You know, this isn't David. The world's not some kind of commune. The world's not some kind of uh, big, living, breathing community. It's individualism, it's autonomy, it's each one to his own. And I thought, well, what? that's not what the saints were teaching and that's really not what Jesus is teaching. And so this idea for me of non-possession and non-ownership, some people were even telling me that's radical, David, you better, better not say that. You're not gonna get invited to any course conferences if you start talking about non-attachment, non-possession, non-ownership, that's too radical. They're just going to call you a cult and a sect and they're just going to label and dismiss you and you're going to end up in the dust by the side of the road if you start talking about those radical things. I say, well, what book are you reading? Well, the same one, but what's the lesson 128 say to you? The world I see holds nothing that I want. What part of nothing that I want don't you understand? You know. David, watch out, that's too radical. Come on now, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna make it if you start going too radical. Come back to planet Earth. But actually, every time I watch a Jesus movie or a St. Francis movie or a Gandhi or whatever, I'm always struck by the peacefulness, the simplicity, the, the happiness, and it's not coming from the images of the world. And so, when you start to understand the metaphysics, you see that, that the ego made this time-space cosmos and this world to keep you mindless. It doesn't want you to know that, that there is such a thing as a mind. It may talk about th thoughts, but it doesn't want you to actually think that they're completely invisible, like this completely invisible thing called a state of mind. In fact, the ego even likes it when you talk about rewiring the brain or uh, thoughts being like little neurotransmitter that are moving in the gray matter, little electrical impulses. The ego likes to take something like thought and put it into the brain as if a brain thinks. And then Jesus comes along and he says, no, the body doesn't feel, the body doesn't think, 
even though if, if you point up here a lot of times to the head, it's like, again, reinforcing the, the, the thoughts are little neurotransmitters happening in the brain. And no, thoughts are not neurotransmitters. And thoughts are not in the brain. And the mind is not the brain. And the body, he tells us, the body is outside you. And he says that in order to, in Lesson 135, in order to free yourself and free your mind and wake up to the Kingdom of Heaven, you have to see the body actually as something quite apart from you. Because it's the longest lesson in the book, and he says anytime you you do anything for the body, you plan for it, you do anything for its betterment, you do anything to protect it, you do anything to preserve it, you do anything at all that involves the body, you're always dealing with the past or the future. You cannot know the mind except in the holy instant, the divine mind. And you cannot know who you are till you access the holy instant, the present moment. And he says in that lesson, you know, he t says, don't activate the past, don't organize the present, and don't plan the future. Whoa, that's amazing. That's amazing. That just, he's actually giving the big I need do nothing invitation right there. And it's, I think it's the same lesson where he talks about the, the, you can't know the problem that the plan was meant to solve, the means, and, and the outcome. You can't know the outcome which is best in any situation. You cannot know the outcome which is best, the means by which to achieve the, the solution, or you cannot even know the problem that the plan is meant to solve. Talk about being clueless. You have to be super, super, super clueless. Uh, to, to not activate the past, organize the present, plan the future, to not know the means, outcome which is best, or the problem that the plan is meant to solve. When I look at that, I actually was going through that lesson today, mentally, and I was just thinking, oh my gosh, it's, it's got everything in it. Because all of the, even the ethics of this world, the, the legal systems of the world, the rules of this world, the social norms, the mores, even in your family, if you have certain codes of, of behavior or beliefs that are operating in the family, all of those things are defenses against the holy instant. So you have to really be willing to, to let it all go. Um, oftentimes in spirituality, you know, there, there is a sense at at trying to achieve a balance. And I think even when we talk about balance, we, we really have to be really clear what we're talking about when we talk about balance, because the world is, of duality was set up by the ego to keep the mind ping-ponging back and forth between opposites so that it would never know the, the stillness of be still and know that I'm God. It set up a world of opposites, and even when you talk about balance and equilibrium, you have to be careful that you're not talking about equilibrium between things in the world. Because the peace of God is not reached through any kind of in-betweenness. Because in-betweenness implies two or more, multiplicity, and that's a projection of the ego. And that's how sneaky this ego is. Even if you think, you, oh, I'll have peace if I have harmony in my house, uh, you know, Jesus is saying, well, it's not actually going to come about in your house. It's, it's in your mind. And to me, living a life of non-possession, non-control, non-competition, of, of diving into miracles, diving into purpose, diving into function, going for this, I think really the only way that you can actually come to a consistent state of peace or happiness and joy is you have to radically go for the teachings of Jesus Christ. I mean radically, not half-heartedly, not 80, 90, 95 percent. You, you still will encounter the prison 
even with a 95% uh, effectiveness. But what we want to do tonight, that's why it's, I think it's number one in the poll, miracle-mindedness, is that's our, that's our direction. Buddha called it the middle way. I think Jesus just calls it the miracle. And he's leading us to be consistently right-minded. What is a miracle but, but a, a state of mind that simply sees the false as false? It literally comes from above. It, a miracle is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and then the miracle comes into consciousness, which is the domain of the ego, and the miracle comes in and it starts to light the mind up. And then the more you start to tune into that, those messages from above, those beautiful beams of light, those miracle beams that start coming like laser beams into your consciousness, the more consistently you start to line up, then the mind does light up. And you do have feelings and experiences that you are not of this world. You have real surreal experiences, sometimes mystical experiences that are so transcendent that they, they, you, you get a glimpse of heaven uh, from the mystical experiences. But as your mind lights up, basically it's just the awareness that mind is causative and there is nothing outside of mind. Everything is mind. Last weekend, well, it was just a flash, but last weekend, I was talking about the involuntary nature of miracles. That, and then I was saying, actually, when you see this, then you quickly start to see that everything is involuntary. Nobody's causing anything. Nothing's happening in the world. There, there aren't forces at work in the world. There aren't dynamics at work in the world. No, the whole thing is being orchestrated by Jesus. And, and if you, it, you know, that's also, uh, I think in Lesson 135, I keep talking about that. What could you not accept if you but knew that everything is, is planned by one who, who, knows your, who knows your good? If you could see the perfect orchestration of everything, then you wouldn't have a care in the world because you wouldn't believe there's a world to care about. You know, you, you would be so in your mind, your divine mind, so unified that you would not react or respond to the images anymore. And Jesus is a great example of that. I mean, going through his, his earth life, those three years of public teaching ministry, including the crucifixion and the resurrection, that was a, a great example. In fact, we had a, a good list of maybe seven, eight, nine movies, but we've chosen a Jesus movie again because what better way can we find the miracle-mindedness than by watching the Master? And not only the Master, this Jesus movie is a, a little bit different angle than most of your Jesus movies. This is, we, we just recently, not too long ago, we had an angle through Mary Magdalene, which was a beautiful angle. Now, we're going to get a different angle. We're going to get kind of the angle of a Roman centurion, a non-believer, uh, someone who's, who's watching the whole thing from his self-concept of a Roman centurion, from uh, being a Roman soldier, a leader. And, and to me, this is probably even more spectacular because the contrast is amazing. When your whole belief system is based on an external world, which for a Roman centurion, <laughs> it definitely is. Julius Caesar is at the top of the slave system. <laughs> I think he's pretty much on top of the whole world at this point. I think, um, well, if you look at history, there were some clashes. Even Caesar, you know, there's always competition. Um, uh, Cleopatra, they, oh, shh. There was things going on there in the Middle East. <laughs> Caesar thought, oh, I got the Mediterranean and then Cleopatra, oh. You know, but see, this has been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries. But here we've got a Roman guard who's right there at the time of Jesus. And 
the other thing I was just telling the group here, I really like Clavius. That's it? Clavius. <laughs> I got the name right. I don't want it to sound like a jello or something. Uh, Clavius, the Roman centurion, you know, he's got, he thinks he's basically got a job to do as a soldier, as a leader, but in his heart, he's really not so caught up with this whole idea of war and killing people. He has a, a wife, a family back in Rome, and he would really like things to settle down so he can get back to his family, his wife and family, and just get a house outside of Rome somewhere in the country and just live a peaceful life. So even the Roman centurion is yearning for peace. And he's yearning for it in the future, like a few other billion people on the planet are, are looking for peace, but it seems like a future achievement. And then Jesus is coming along with his beautiful message of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he's teaching a state of mind that is readily available, but is covered over by schemes of, of slavery, hierarchies, possession, competition, and all the things that this world seems to have as part of the mask or the, the veil that covers over the, the Christ. So, tonight, we will watch the movie Risen. And we are kind of on a Jesus roll because uh, we're working our way towards the, the, our retreat coming up the beginning of November, which is titled? Jesus, our beloved elder brother. Jesus, our beloved elder brother. So we are on a Jesus roll. And even though I, I did really try to consider a lot of different movies, then, but the number one pole sitter was Miracle Mindedness. So it's pretty obvious that uh, this movie really gets at the miracle mindedness because uh, of, of one of the characters in the movie is Jesus. And <laughs> he kind of, it's, it stacks the deck. Miracle mindedness. <laughs> So, so I think we're going to enjoy it, and um, I think um, I think Susan Jamison, weren't we talking recently about the 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 uh, our favorite Jesus in all the Jesus movies? Wasn't it? Was it this one? It wasn't you. It was somebody else. <laughs> well, this is this definitely has to be one of the best. Jesus is because it's he's such a happy peaceful uh, Jesus you know we always like the laughing Jesus but this is really a very happy peaceful Jesus and uh, some people have told me he kind of looks Mexican uh, we live around this every day we so we we get we get a lot of it uh, but but that's part of our, it's a state of mind. I think you just draw forth the witnesses. But I think, I think in this case, um, the, they still, I think we still see a, a crucifixion um, scene of Jesus on, on the cross, but that gets used as part of a contrast for our, our, our Clavius, our Roman centurion, because um, that's a pretty big contrast between a, a a crucified Jesus and a resurrected Jesus. Even in the world of images, that's like, that's a mind-blowing um, uh, image to see uh, from what you think you saw, what you think you knew, and then have your entire thought system inverted uh, in one instant. And and that's basically what the miracle does. It It puts cause and effect back in the proper order, and it shows that you're dreaming a dream and that that what you think you see is is actually not the truth but for those of us who have have been watching this dream for many many years um, we do need our miracles and our glimpses and our our you might say radical shifts of mind to start to show us the things as they really are, not as we have believed them to be. 
from our past perspective. So sit back, enjoy the movie, and I will pop in during the movie for a little bit of commentary as we go to escape the matrix and we rise up ourselves uh, in, in the light. <laughs> okay. We have a Jesus movie that's starting off with, it is finished and starting off with the crucifixion scene. Uh, so this gives us a good um, context for this world because we can see that even compared to today's standards, <laughs> this is a pretty seemingly barbaric world, um, even into, by today's standards. And, but it's more than barbaric and more than overtly violent seemingly. There's, there's clashes uh, between the Romans and the Jews, there's clashes inside, in between people that are part of the, the Jews. The zealots are like the rebellious nature, Barabbas and the zealots were fighting in the first scene, uh, the Romans. The Romans are there to rule and to keep order. And so basically Pilate has, has sent Clavius out to keep order, like set things right. It, and we also see this is, this is not too different from today's politics. I mean, anything that seems political, we, we seem to have a lot of political clashes that are going on in the world, in the United States. The polarization uh, seems to have grown greater and greater. And uh, again, this, this world we're seeing Galilee 2,000 years ago is, is really showing that, that polarization. Of course, that's what the ego has done. It's made a projection of, of the hatred. It's taken its own hatred of God. The ego has a huge hatred of God. And then it's projected out on, onto the world. And yet it, it always wants God to grant reality to the dream world. And so there's a lot of rage that God hasn't granted the wish that the ego wished this world of time and space be real. God would not be God uh, with that kind of granting that wish. So that wish is not granted. And yet the projection of that hatred goes out onto to the world. So it's an interesting beginning in the sense that now we can really start to look closer at the ego and all of its motives and backstories. Because um, in most Jesus movies, you know, we have the so-called virgin birth, and it even rolls back before the virgin birth. Um, and then it rolls all the way through Jesus becoming uh, a teacher, uh, the Messiah, three years of public teaching, then a crucifixion, and then a resurrection. So we're starting this movie at the time of, of him uh, bleeding on the cross. And again, this is just helpful for us whenever you're tempted to watch the news, whenever you're tempted to take a, a side, a political side, whenever you're ever wanting to advocate for or against something of this world, in, in the world we perceive today, this is where a teaching device like this comes in handy. Remember, our workbook lesson for the day is, I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts. The ego does not want you to realize that, because as soon as you realize that, then that is the beginning of the end for the ego belief system in your mind. Because without projection and without denial and repression, the ego, it just gets exposed. And then when you expose it and you look at it, you think, I can't, I don't want to invest my mind energy in this anymore. <laughs> talk about Russian roulette or talk about a death wish. Why would you give your mind over to a death wish that you saw exactly as it was? But if you didn't see it exactly as it was, and you just saw an external world where some things looked attractive, some things looked unattractive, some things looked like they were worth pursuing, 
worth striving for, worth fighting for. Other things look like they're worth destroying or worth avoiding, but it's a trick. The things Jesus says in the Course, the dreams that you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear has entered. I'll say that again. The dreams that you think you like can hold you back as much as those where the fear has entered. So, so much for the secret, so much for manifesting the, the world of your dreams. Um, if, as long as there's a hierarchy of illusions and you've got some illusions that are better than others, that just denies that they're all illusions. How can you have good illusion and bad illusion? Illusion is, it means by definition not real. So that would be like having good not real <laughs> and bad not real. Attractive not real and unattractive not real. This is where the metaphysics of the Course are so helpful. They're really saving us time, collapsing the Alpha and the Omega, showing it's all simultaneous because it's, it's saying, don't be tempted to take a side or don't be tempted to be for or against anything in this world. Uh, sometimes when people hear that, they go, wow, that sounds really uh, passive. That's passive. And I think in our last retreat to the weekend, uh, Eric had that quote, forgiveness is quiet, That's, it does nothing. Forgiveness is still and quietly does nothing. Forgiveness is still and quietly does nothing. It looks, and waits, and watches, and judges, and judges not. If you want to call that passive, be my guest. <laughs> if you want to call that passive. That sounds meek to me. <laughs> That's as meek as you get. But, but now we're watching some pretty intensely, from the ego's perspective, intensely violent scenes. And you can see that Clavius is like, he looks like somebody who's got a job that he's not too happy with. You know, even when he's all bloodied and he comes in from a battle, you know, the, the prefect wants to see you, you know, Pontius Pilate. And, and so he goes in there and, and basically he gets a few jokes from, the, from Pontius Pilate and then go out there and keep the order, restore order because that's part of governing. When you're on top of the chain that governs what uh, Francis said, there was all these layers of slavery. When you're the one governing it, the one thing you have to do to keep the rule, to keep on top of the system of slavery is you have to keep some semblance of order. If everything turns to chaos and mayhem, then you, then you, that topples over the, the ruling class, that top, topples over the few that seem to be in charge. So even from the ego system, uh, the ego doesn't care if you minimize fear as long as you don't let it go. That's what all defense mechanisms do. They, they actually keep the ego in place by minimizing fear and, and, and yet keeping the fear, keeping the guilt. So we'll see where it goes from here, but uh, Wow, if you think that was graphic at the beginning, we're just getting warmed up here. But this is a great forgiveness movie. This is fantastic forgiveness movie because if you have any emotions, reactions that come up, you can see that, that even though Jesus has been crucified, the threat is perceived as, as still there. And this is really showing us that this is a world of ideas and the, the, the issue that we've got going on is conflicting ideas in the mind. There was Joseph of Arimathea, a Sanhedrin, but, but actually mourning Yeshua's passing, saying he was special. And then we have Caiaphas and the other Sanhedrin and it, they went in there like a political mob to Pilate. They're like saying, oh, you need to uh, either burn the body or you need to make sure that this body doesn't disappear. 
Now you can see the pressure's on. Uh, it's not enough to have a, a dead Jesus, but the pressure is he said he would rise again, and they're saying, they don't even expect that. They don't think he's going to rise again. But a missing body, oh, that just turns the mythology of Jesus. They're like, now we're never going to hear the end of this. That, that there's Yahweh, one God, instead of many God, there is Yahweh, and that Jesus came, and he said he would rise again, and if and now the Sanhedrin are going, oh my God, worst nightmare. If that body disappears, if that stone, if that, that we need a seal, we need to get some, something that we can fight this idea of a risen Jesus. So it's clearly showing us that it's, it's, it's the ideas is where the threats are. It's not that people are threats, it's conflicting ideas in the mind, because Jesus has come, he's taught his teachings, he, he went through the, the crucifixion, and now he's been put in Joseph of Arimathea's family's tomb, and the concern for Pilate and the concern for the Sanhedrin is they have to have a body, and they have to have the evidence they're very concerned about the outcome, not just the death, but they have to have a dead body to show, to disprove the myth. They're, they're thinking what Jesus was talking about, about rising again, is a myth. We cannot have that myth. There'll be more unrest if the Jews go, he's the one, he was the one, and he said he would rise again, and now his body's gone, he, he's rose again, and for years to come, decades, centuries to come, there it was. Yeah, he, he did. He, and so they don't, aren't even anticipating a resurrected body. They just know that they have to have a body. Isn't this the same when we have crime scenes and murders? If, if, if somebody is killed, then it's like the ego shifts into overdrive. Who did it? Where is the body? You know, Agatha Christie, what would Agatha Christie ever done with her murder novels if it wasn't about finding the body? Except this time it's with Jesus, like the Sanhedrin are going, oh no, you have to, you have to have, we have to have a body. We have to have a body of evidence that this zealot rebel who, who was blaspheming all the time, you can see from the Sanhedrin point of view, he was the enemy. He was the enemy to traditional Judaism. He's the enemy of all traditions in Judaism because he would say, your sins are forgiven. They'd ready to stone him when he'd say that because, what do you mean? Who are you, you think you're God to forgive sins? The Jewish belief, only God can forgive sins. Now we have the course, God does not forgive for he is never condemned. Well, they'd really have the stones out it's a good thing we're here in 2020, we just have a, a plague to deal with, not going around saying, God didn't create the world, and, and you know, and God doesn't forgive. Here come the rocks. But actually, you can see that this is really showing us, this movie is showing us that the problem is conflicting ideas. And that's why the holy instant, the present moment, that's why the atonement is so important, because the atonement is saying there aren't conflicting ideas, that forgiveness comes from the Holy Spirit, but forgiveness is a unifying belief. It's, it's an illusion, because in, in heaven there's nothing to forgive, but in terms of the separation, it's a unifying belief. That's why forgiveness is one. It's one unified mind. It's like the quantum field. It's completely unified. It's not multiple. It's not diverse. It's not it's not dualistic, it's just one, it's one correction with a capital C. That's the atonement. And that's what Jesus was teaching and demonstrating. So I think this is a fascinating movie because now, now we're seeing the, 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 the power that the ego gives to the belief in martyrdom. Martyrdom. It's, the, the ego says martyrdom is dangerous because people may believe something 
and other people may believe something else and it could be a big conflict. Um, and this goes on all the time when somebody dies, some say, oh, so-and-so was a martyr. Some say they were a saint. Some say good things about them. Some say bad things, but it's really showing us that the conflict is going on in the mind. And as long as you have conflicting beliefs in the mind, that is the definition too of, of a split mind. And Jesus is saying, the ego is unreal. The Holy Spirit is the remembrance of, of reality. The ego is a death wish. The Holy Spirit is the remembrance of eternal life. And that's our choice. And believe me, they don't conflict. Why? Because one is real and one is not. And Jesus says that in the Course. Truth does not fight against illusions, nor do illusions battle with the truth. Illusions battle only with themselves. As long as you have conflicting ideas that you're trying to hold on into your mind, Jesus calls this dissociation. He says you're trying to believe things that, that aren't true, and you're trying to hold on to uh, things, and even in terms of of the ego and the Holy Spirit, he's saying the definition of a split mind is you want them both. You want them both in your mind. <laughs> and that's dissociation. You're, you are deluded if you think that love and fear can coexist. He's saying you are deluded if you believe that. Now Jesus is going to demonstrate to us that, that you don't have to believe in both. You actually can hear one voice and you can actually align up totally with the light and, and have nothing to do whatsoever with the ego and with the darkness. But th these scenes are just packed and loaded because they're giving us huge insights of, of what we need to do to escape the conflict. And the escape is not going to come from something in form, from a form outcome. In this case, um, the Sanhedrin do not want uh, uh, the myth of, of Jesus, the Messiah, to continue on. They want to put a rest, put to an end, the belief in a, a Jesus as a Messiah. And in order to do that, they just only need one piece of evidence. One thing, a body. And if you think Agatha Christie had to have a body search, you're going to see one of the strongest body searches now, <laughs> because Pilate needs a body. He, he's got a group of people, the Sanhedrin, that are, that are like saying, you think it's bad now. <laughs> you, you ain't seen nothing if, if you don't prove and bring an end to this Messiah complex. You better bring a quick end to the Messiah complex or you're really going to, to get it. And, and of course, Pilate's joking with him. He said, yeah, yeah, he, I thought you were not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And they're coming to him on the Sabbath. So he's like, let me enjoy my Sunday here. And he's pointing out their contradiction. But, you know, they, they said, no, 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 this is really important. So we're going to see now coming up uh, one of the, the, the strongest body searches <laughs> in the history. Even Columbo would have been impressed with this one, because this is like a major body search, because the motive underneath it is have to have the evidence to stop the, the Messiah uh, myth from growing too big in proportion. So, Clavius is, is, is quite disturbed at the first, uh, first witnesses that he's interviewed, because it it goes against his uh, belief system. He, he is interrogating them in order to find the evidence and, and ultimately to try to find the body. That's what he's looking for, a body of evidence uh, to support the belief system. And this is what Jesus says in the workbook. He says that when the mind is asleep and believes in the ego, it's constantly trying to justify its thoughts with the projected world. 
It's always looking for evidence. All of the legal systems, all of the ethical systems, all of the systems of rulings and judges and all these outcomes, Jesus says, are just attempts to justify these ego thoughts. And that's why he says in the Course, anger is never justified. And then he says, the beginning of the next paragraph, pardon is always justified because he's teaching us that whenever you use anything in form or any form outcomes to support your thoughts, you are wanting to be right rather than happy. You are, you are caught up in a delusional system where you're trying to collect evidence that was even projected by the ego. You're trying to collect evidence to prove being right about something, to make a point, to win an argument, to be right about anything is to try to use witnesses of the world and evidence from the world to justify the thinking. And he's saying it won't work. You actually have to give up these judgments. That's why he taught judge not. You can't ever use anything of the world as a justification for what you're thinking or feeling because your thoughts and your feelings and your beliefs have produced the world. So it's a closed system. The attack thoughts and the projected world are a closed loop. And that's why it's, that's why people commit suicide. That's why people are clinically depressed. That's why people go through panic attacks, anxiety, is because it's a closed loop system between, Jesus would say, the thoughts you think you think and the images you think you see. And it's so tight, it's, it's completely closed. There's no way anything can enter, except a miracle. He says, you, you may believe you would need a miracle to see something different. Yes, <laughs> you do. He says, you, you need a miracle to come and intervene between your mind and these thoughts you think you think and these uh, images you think. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. My meaningless shots, thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. He's describing a, a tight loop of ego. So here he's seen some, some witnesses and he's kind of looking at his assistant like, oh great, now you're bringing me a blind, when he just gives him a look like blind woman. Great, great. And then she comes in and witnesses, he loved me. <laughs> you know, he lifted me up. He lifted you up. You know, he's just, now he's, he's everything. But, but even the first two witnesses, the woman, the blind woman, I heard his voice. I heard his voice on the street. I hear voices. Yeah, yeah, you hear voices. You know, you can see the, the sarcasm and the, of, of Clavius, you know, because he's like, wow, I'm getting nowhere here. But nothing really has prepared him for this next witness. This next witness is like someone from our community to go in <laughs> who's into no private thoughts and no people pleasing, who's into you promise to swear the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And now this Clavius is not prepared for because he's used to meeting a bunch of scared Jewish people. Uh, even the, the blind woman the, and the, the first one that he saw, you know, you know, it's like, oh, you're a Roman. Yeah, yeah, there's fear, <laughs> but not this next witness. Now we have true empathy <laughs> coming in who doesn't seem to care about the world or the Romans or the Jews or the Sanhedrin or anything because we have actually a disciple. <laughs> of, he's asking the disciples because he's on a body hunt, but now he finds one who's going to come in. So let's enjoy this because this is the beginning of the unraveling <laughs> of Clavius's egoic thought system. And it takes a witness to a miracle to unravel something that's so tightly wound in there with so much evidence. Um, you know, he, he thinks, he doesn't really know what to believe about Jesus, but he's still on the pathway of following his boss to find the body and, and be able to uh, protect Rome and the Sanhedrin from this mythical belief 
that a risen Messiah will come back to overthrow Rome and overthrow the whole Jewish <laughs> traditional religion. That's, that's a big threat to in the eyes of the Roman Empire, the Messiah to overthrow, you know, they've heard that. Wait till the Messiah comes, you know. Barabbas told him, you just wait till the Messiah comes. So now, talk about egg on your face, pie, cream pie in the face. The Romans do not want that, and the Sanhedrin don't want that either. They want to keep the people subservient to the, the Jewish ruling class and the Romans want to keep the, the Jewish ruling class and everybody else subservient to Caesar. So there's a lot at stake here. And here we go. He's, he's asking for witnesses. So here we go. I think this is our, this is our return something to your eyes. And if it's a video, something to your ears. And this is what every search is about. And, and Clavius, based on his belief system, based on his entire perception of the world, it's all based on finding the solution. Every murder mystery, every curiosity of the world is the same search. And, and yet, that's why we have A Course in Miracles, because there is a moment when everything stops and you suddenly realize that perhaps you were wrong about everything, <laughs> absolutely everything that you've ever believed, ever. So, here we go. This is the beginning of miracle-mindedness when he's found, he's seen Mary Magdala in the upper room and he's charging um, up one piece of evidence that contradicts everything that he's ever believed. And now he's kind of in the middle. He doesn't know what, <laughs> what to do. That's what's so good about this movie. It's for all of us, the first time we start to have these experiences, you know, it's a, it's, it's a talk about a turnaround. Wow. Yeah, we, should, we, have, we could have Byron Katie comment on that turnaround. When he walks upstairs into that upper room and sees that, it's in, the whole thought system has been contradicted. He wrote that in his letter that he left, you know. I've seen two contradictory things. Uh, I've seen a man who's dead and I've seen the same man alive. And, and that, just that one experience is what we could call like a crack. There's a crack in the cosmic consciousness. There's a crack in the belief system. And it does take that crack to begin the process of miracle-mindedness, to be convinced by miracles. But it just takes one moment of, of evidence that contradicts every single thing that you believe, and then the, that's, that's the crack right there. And then it just opens the mind up to what is called miracle-mindedness. It's, it's called, that's the number one uh, theme on our poll, the miracle-mindedness. It, it has begun when there's an experience that doesn't fit with what came before. It doesn't fit with what the past has taught. No longer can the past be relied on as sure. It has a crack in it, a crack in the armor of, of defenses. So, you know, he's at this point, he is following along the apostles as they had towards Galilee, and, and they, he's heard Mary Magdalene say that, that he, he will appear again. And so they're into listen and follow. They're just following this uh, guidance that they've heard and, and, and happily moving along and trusting, which they've been doing for three years. 
of Jesus's public ministry. But but the fascinating thing is Clavius because Clavius is now he's he doesn't consider himself an apostle. He doesn't consider himself a disciple, and I don't think he's sure what he is now. Uh, if somebody asks him, "Are you a believer?" Um, it's just been one flesh, kind of like the guard that's talked about the flesh that happened at night when they were sleeping. And he had fear of this flesh. And he told the story. And when uh, Clavius said, you, you had been drinking, you know, it, it, the, you had the, the liquor that was tainted in some way, you know, it was, it was doctored with. And then that was something he could, really, you think so? Oh. You know, he he was looking for any kind of evidence that could explain what he went through on that night. And Clavius was offering something that he was like, oh. But he said, or it could be that what we what I saw was the truth, you know. And, and, and that's what happened to Clavius. Now he is, he doesn't know what to make of anything. And I think that's that's very common on the spiritual journey, on the journey of awakening. It, there comes uh, disorientation, there comes disillusionment, there comes a sense of, of doubt, of wondering, suspecting, wandering. Uh, Jesus says in the Course, doubt will come and go and go to come again, yet is the ending certain. He's pointing towards the light, but he's saying, there's going to be a lot of back and forth and a lot of wavering. And just the way Clavius is positioned at a distance, you can tell he has seen enough for him to follow along from a distance. <laughs> like, he is not ready to get too close. Because, again, there's something about what he perceived. If that is true, then he must have been very completely mistaken about a lot of things. And he's got a lot of question marks flying around in his, his mind. But I think that's what makes this into a really good teaching movie. When you start to take it in, when you start to really take it in, you can start to see, wow, this is what I'm confronted with as I go through a day. It's, at times I... I see things that that don't measure up evidence-wise, and yet this is the transition of opening to become more miracle-minded and consistently miracle-minded. It's a convincing, it's like the Holy Spirit has to convince the mind that it's been completely wrong about absolutely everything that it's perceived. And that's why we have A Course in Miracles starting off with lesson number one, nothing I see means anything. It's a, it's a mind training program that's actually designed to take you right there where Jesus is, is leading. But I find it fascinating to, to watch this because um, in one sense, uh, this angle on the whole thing is, is a very, very different angle. Uh, you never read the book of Clavius in the New Testament, <laughs> but actually it could be there <laughs> if you see what he's seen and, and how his mind has just been turned in, in that one sighting, then that is definitely a crack to, uh, to miracle-mindedness. I mean, I thought of even showing some comedy movies like uh, Bruce Almighty, and there's definitely a turnaround that occurs in there, but uh, Morgan Freeman playing God has to do quite a lot of convincing of Bruce <laughs> in a comical way to convince him that, that it's much different than what Bruce thinks it is. But in this movie, this is, is striking because, you know, the, this Roman man has was quite sure of himself until that one scene. And then everything started to dismantle and loosen. 
So it's a beautiful movie. I just, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am watching that face on Clavius when he goes in that room and then he kind of staggers out and, and tells his assistants, stand down, tell them all to stand down. Because uh, in his mind, he's, st he's standing down. <laughs> he couldn't really say anything else. I don't think he could come up with a, another word or another set of words, because his mind was totally stunned by that. And that, that has got to be one of the best <laughs> moments in... Oh, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. I think, um, yeah, as I was watching that, it reminded me of the, the past weekend where I was talking about Miracles are involuntary and, and everything just comes down to pray, listen, and follow. And then that's the convincing when you do that. In fact, in the Urtext, it was, I think it was edited out of the published, published edition of the course, but there was a part in the Urtext where um, Jesus was basically saying, I, I need um, active miracle workers. And he, he gave an instruction there in the Urtext, uh, and it was, listen, learn, and do. And actually I had a, a friend of mine uh, from Hong Kong uh, was writing, asking me all kinds of questions about practicing his workbook lesson. and. And uh, and I did write to him. He, he said, "Well, how how is this going to work? And what is the key?" And I said, "Well, it's practical application." And he said, "Question mark and more." You know, he was typing, texting me on Facebook Messenger, and I said, "You know, listen, learn, and do. Listen and follow. Uh, that that is everything." And I noticed in this movie that. Uh, after Clavius went up searching, searching to find the, the apostles, opened the door and saw what he saw, that was, the, that was his turnaround moment. And then he heard what he heard, which is basically Mary, Mary Magdalene said, I have heard, because they were all, disciples were wondering, apostles were saying, what do we do, what do we do? And she said, you've heard it from him, uh, go you know, go to Galilee and he will, he will see you there. And so that was a decision point right there for Clavius, you know, does he flee? Does he uh, return back to Pilate in his position? Uh, does he follow the apostles? He followed, he followed along. That was his big turning point, his listen and follow. And then he stayed his distance, but then uh, once it came to a point when um, the, the Roman soldiers and the tracker were getting closer and closer, then that's exactly how the Holy Spirit works. As soon as you take the step to follow, and you follow, and you follow, then even if you're keeping your distance, the Holy Spirit's MO, which is method of operation, is you will be given opportunities. Soon as you say yes, as soon as you follow, then here come the opportunities. And then he immediately said, you know, that they have a tracker. They can't know that we're up here. The apostles said they already do. And he sprung right into action, trying to uh, help the apostles uh, escape from the top of the ridge where they were through, through the crevices and the cracks, only to come upon his assistant, his loyal assistant. Here we go. This is exactly how the Holy Spirit works. Oh, you've, you're going to follow. Yes. At a distance. But you're following. Yes. Still had his defenses up, you know, when Simon Peter came to bring him water. He... He, whoosh, his, the old past reactions whoosh, 
came out as he jumped into defense mode, only to have Peter say it was water <laughs> and pour the whole canteen out. Water. <laughs> you, you sliced me on the, on the leg for the water I was bringing, you know. Uh, and then he took uh, Clavius's sword and hurled it like, that is not helpful here, <laughs> not helpful at all. And yet after that, he did, he was given the opportunity by the Holy Spirit to spring into action. And when confronted with his assistant, seemingly ready to cry out and give their location and everything, you know, he did come to that point where he was able to say to his former assistant, <laughs> uh, there are no enemies here. And so there it was, he was springing immediately, the Spirit into, had him springing into action. What Jesus tells us in the Course is, teach what you would learn, and teach only love, for that is what you are. He, he went from, from this role uh, that he had of serving Pilate and to, to this role of, of teaching peace and teaching there are no enemies here. And eventually, as, as he told uh, his former assistant, just, go, just walk forward and say nothing. And, um, and then made sure the apostles were able to, to get away. You could see that that that's exactly how we lay aside the past. We lay aside the former roles. His, his role of serving Caesar and of, of serving Pontius Pilate had ended. And, uh, and he taught it. He taught it right there. He taught it his first chance. This is exactly how the Holy Spirit works. He, he has you open yourself to ideas, open yourself with faith, open yourself to believing, and then wink. He brings in these teach what you are. These, uh, I guess that's the second lesson of the Holy Spirit. You know, the first lesson is to have, give all to all. The second lesson of the Holy Spirit is to have peace, teach peace, to learn it. And there it was. He had to step out of the role, and he had to see his assistant as a brother, and he had to teach peace, and he did, and he had to be very strong in his faith. He was called upon to have his faith right there. And that's the convincing. It just goes, it just are presented with situations where you teach what you would learn. And that's the method of, of awakening. That's how spiritual awakening occurs. And then, as he went to the Sea of Galilee, and he saw the faith that they all had, and he followed them out into the fishing boat, and uh, he watched as uh, they threw their net out, and, and the fish, it came in with fish, and he watched as, as Simon Peter saw Jesus, uh, and followed what Jesus had said from the shore, throw, cast your net to the right of the boat, and, and then he watched them run out into the water with such glee and happiness and run over and surround Jesus so, so happy. And again, these are the witnesses. These are the witnesses of faith. He has to teach what he would learn. His tender, brand new faith is put to the test and off he goes. And including that night uh, before Jesus uh, was ready to disappear, you know, when he went up and, and sat next to him and said, I don't even know what to ask. And um, he had this beautiful, calm, tranquil, very friendly, soft encounter uh, with Jesus. And you can see, in one sense, <clears throat> I feel like he had turned the corner. He was on his way. It's kind of like that, um, he was on his way, his way was set, and he could say uh, to the man that was hosting him at the, at the very beginning and end of the movie, he could say, I, I believe. He had turned the corner, he had turned the corner of belief.
And that is no small thing. That is no small thing. I was talking to a friend uh, recently who was going through some fear and resistance and everything, and was really pondering things pretty deeply. And I said, well, I said, you know, it still comes down to faith. I said, uh, even Helen Schuckman, who somewhere in her mind agreed to take down this Course in Miracles uh, as her conscious perception of herself as a research, an atheistic research psychologist at a prestigious Colombian Presbyterian Medical Center, resisted and fought and kicked and, and had enormous difficulty uh, scribing the course over seven years. And then after the course, received a couple more pamphlets, psychotherapy pamphlets, song of prayer. And then as her life continues on, um, it did not get easier. She didn't quite have it in her to turn the corner. She was very protective after the course first came and she was, would say things to Bill like, I can't believe what they're doing with my course. <laughs> she, was, she was, you know, like a mother who had given birth to a child <laughs> and the course was now her baby. I can't believe what these people are saying and doing about my course. So she was kind of like a very protective mother and also very extremely resistant to the teachings. Uh, so much so that, that Helen Schuckman was quoted as saying, when asked about the course, um, is the course, is the course really true? Helen said, oh, I know it's true. I just don't believe it. So there you have it from the scribe. But there you see Flavius. Flavius. 2,000 years ago, a Roman working for Caesar, working for things. And of course, he had in his sighting <laughs> an appearance that was pretty strong. Talk about a crack in cosmic consciousness. That was a crack. And the first time I saw this movie, I was just, wow, I love it. On the big screen, <laughs> what a scene. He follows Mary Magdalene with his, with his sword, <laughs> pushes the door open and walks through, and oh, the unexpected nature of, of the miracle. You never know when it will strike, but that, that was enough, that was enough of a crack that he followed, he followed. He still was staggered, he still was disoriented. You could tell, he, could, he was walking very slowly when he went back into that room the second time. Those legs were moving very, very slowly. He, looks, he looked like a boxer that got hit on the chin. You know, he was still on his feet, but he was he was staggered. He was walking very slowly. And then he slumped down against the wall and just took it in. It reminded me of that in Solaris, that movie I used to teach Spiritual Awakening, where the, the Chris Kelvin, played by George Clooney, you know, when he comes to the little boy at the end and, and the ship is getting closer to Solaris with the kind of the pink light, and then the little boy comes over to him and, and he, Chris Kelvin, just the psychologist, like just crumples up against the wall, very much like Clavius did, just crumpled up and then the little boy reaches out his hand. That's like the Christ child saying, you know, have faith, have faith, I'm here, I'm with you. As Solaris, the lights are getting more in the ship seems to be being engulfed in Solaris, which to me was just symbolic of, of the divine law, as you, as you give, so shall you receive. Except the closer they got to Solaris, then that's why his, his uh, wife, Rhea, appeared to him uh, and um, 
and he was so frightened when she appeared because that broke his his belief that when the in the dead and gone he thought Rhea had committed suicide and she was dead and gone in that movie and then when she appeared again he was so terrified it broke his perception so radically that he put her in a little space capsule and he ejected her out into the cosmos that's a good symbol of of the fear of the light and yet we saw it on the, the guard's face, you know, the flesh that he talked about. You know, the, ro the ropes burst and, the, and the, the stone was hurled away like a little fish, you know. It was, and and that, that shattered his perception and he is hoping that he was drunk. <laughs> because if he wasn't drunk, then Okay, how do I handle that? How do I handle, take something in? Where does that fit into my belief system? Because it's so far outside. But we saw with, with Clavius, you know, he, it shattered his, um, his belief system in the world. And then he had a choice right there. And he, he came back in there, right where he had seen the scene the first time. And he crumpled against the wall and he listened. And when they said, it's Galilee, we're, you know, we're going to go see him again in Galilee, he followed at, at a distance, but he followed. And then he was given his opportunities. And that just, to me, that movie is so symbolic for all of us on the, on the journey. Yes, we have things that, that shatter our perception. You know, we, we have these subtle, unconscious beliefs in the future. And they are projections of our past. And we do project through the ego, we project into a future, how will it go? Or some of you might remember the Truman Show uh, when, um, what was her name? Sylvia showed up on, on, came to the library to see Truman and she had a pin that she was wearing, a sweater, a red sweater and a pin. How, how will it end? You know, we have those, how will it end thoughts? And we take thoughts from the past and we project them in the future and we say, how will it end? And then we have this small, still voice inside and it's telling us, relax, it was never begun. You're in a conundrum. You're in a conundrum wondering how will this impossible situation end? What will become of me in the future? If I keep having the faith to follow this, already we draw forth mixed witnesses in this egoic world, and yet there's something that grows stronger and stronger, and slowly it's not so much about how will it end, but, but it comes back to the present moment. It comes back to what all the mystics and saints have talked, how am I now, <laughs> is, is the question. It's never how will it end. It's always, how am I now? What, what am I willing to accept of myself now? The ego asks the first question, what am I? But Christ never asked that question. Christ doesn't have a question. And, and that is the, the certainty that, that beckons to us and calls to us. So I think, I think even the lines from Jesus at the end, you know, that were meant to be really Holy Spirit coming through as a comfort. Like, you know, go, go share the message, share the good news and share it to the ends of the world. He's just saying, listen now and follow. I bring to you the Holy Spirit. I, I deliver the Holy Spirit to you now. Here is my commandment, listen and follow. You know, love God and love your neighbor as yourself and listen and follow to the comforter that I, I have delivered to you. I have, I have hand delivered it. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've hand delivered the Holy Spirit. Now it's up to, to you to listen and to follow. And he did say that when, you know, imagine those that have not seen. He knew Clavius had seen and witnessed things that had cracked his cosmic perception wide open. But he said, imagine those that have not seen this. It's a, his teaching from the Bible, you know, 
Blessed are those that have, have seen and, and believed. Far greater blessed are those who have not seen and believed. You know, he was talking about faith, how much faith it takes. Because the faith is going to be in a different direction than everything of history and everything of time and space. The most accepted beliefs of all of history, it doesn't matter which ones you, you even choose, are, are all false. Forgive your, your brother for what he did not do. What? For what he did not do. It must be that, that everything that was believed about linear time and space had no validity whatsoever. I kept feeling that strong when I was going through Lesson 135 today. My defenselessness, my safety lies. I was like, wow, it's just, just so clear. Just so clear. Like, don't, don't give a thought for the morrow. Take no thought for the morrow. And he's just asking us to come back to listen and follow. He's just saying, you really, really need not plan or prepare to try to make your way back into the Kingdom of Heaven. But you, you can listen and follow, and that everything will be given you. Everything, every instruction, everything that you need will be given in this moment. So, thank you. What a, what a profound uh, movie we had to, I can't think, no wonder it's the miracles are involuntary. I can't even imagine another movie for teaching miracle. Lamb Chop is giving us the thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So let's open it wide open up to everybody and let's just see what everybody experienced and what everybody's feeling and, and uh, just what a beautiful, profound opportunity we have to share this together. Anybody would like to raise their hand or put the instructions in the chat there? Okay, and um, we can start with Esther. Go ahead. Hi, David. Hi. Hi. Um, Oh. <laughs> um, this miracle mindedness um, is what I want to think about. Um, Alan was saying, you know, try not to plan, you know, like with my mother or anything, just bring presence to the um, situation. And um, presence has gotten me to have her open the course as an oracle and the print is too small so I read it to her and it used to be that um, she would have to stop me in the middle and say she can't take it and now she's sitting quietly and and listening we do a lesson we've done it two days in a row now and yet um, I find myself still having myself reminding her about brushing her teeth and um, and using things for her teeth. Um, and I'm not feeling very joyful about it, even though, because I think because I still invest, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. I, I had a great day with her and yet I don't feel joyful about it. I, I feel burdened and I, I don't understand it. I, everything that I've ever wanted was to communicate with her, the course. She doesn't believe it, uh, the course, but she's now willing to listen to it. It's amazing. Um, we, ha we have great days together. What am I missing? Well, I think the thing that the lesson is, is that we cannot ever judge the form. So when you pray to join with your mother, when you pray to 
to be with your mother, when you pray to share your heart and to be fully connected and everything to her, that's the prayer of your heart. And God answers the prayer of the heart with an experience. And yet, we cannot really accept and, and fully embrace that experience until we let go of judging the form. When, when people study the Course in Miracles, it's like the Course is directly meant for the mind that is encountering and experiencing the Course. The Course really isn't for people. It's kind of funny to me that we have these bodies and these little eyes, these little eyes that go back and forth, back and forth and read this book. But, but God knows the prayer of your heart before you utter a word before you read the Course, or even with your mother not wanting to read the Course. But let me ask you a question. Does, does Sarah ever sing prayers in Hebrew? <laughs> that's, that's, that's her connection, you see. Now, now she likes now she wants to hear the Course. I said to her, you know, you're reading the Bible, let's do the Course too. And she's willing. It's interesting. I never saw anything like it. <laughs> well, that's the, the beauty of it is, if you hold the prayer in your heart, you've done your part. Because everything else is, is totally up to the Spirit, and, and we're asked to follow what is on our heart. And we've been practicing this every Wednesday, where we come into the clarity of, okay, what am I hearing? What, what do I need to follow? And then, as far as what other people need to do, how other people need to act or react, what they're supposed to do or not supposed to do, we simply trim those away and we let go of all expectations. And here you have, your mother Sarah singing prayers in Hebrew. I would actually enjoy that. I think if some, if I was with somebody and they started chanting or singing in Hebrew, I probably would just close my eyes and start looking like Stevie Wonder. Uh, right away, I'd be like, I put my sunglasses on and just ah, you know, I would find that delightful. Now, if you if you have any expectations, they're just past thoughts and th learnings and beliefs about mom. Mom is this way. Mom has these conditions. Mom needs to, we talked about that, mom needs to brush her teeth. <laughs> Good daughter Esther must in be the enforcer, like uh, Arnold, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, must enforce the teeth brushing. <laughs> uh, but you see, we, we approached this last week to the point where you just, you can still say the thing, Mom, did you remember to brush your teeth? And you've done your part. That's it. You just lay it on the altar and, and offer it. You've got something to speak. Uh, but you're not chasing the outcomes. And, and I was talking about that at the beginning, Lesson 135. You know, you can be so fully present with her that you don't activate the past, organize the present, or plan the future. You don't need to know the means. You don't need to know the, the goal. You don't need to know the problem the plan was meant to solve. You can be as clueless as Chauncey Gardner in uh, being there, and as happy as Chauncey Gardner, as peaceful as Chauncey Gardner. But just like in this movie, Clavius, you know, we saw him outgrow uh, his, his role. In fact, he had that ring on all the way through the out, outgrowing of the role. He certainly wasn't acting like the character that he had been before. And then at the end, he slides the ring off and he plunks it down on the table and he says, payment. He's offering payment for the man that took him in and fed him. And that was an amazing moment, because to me, and then he said, I believe. Uh, when he took that ring off and he said, I believe, that is very much like in the Mary Magdalene movie, when, when Mary goes into the water to be baptized 
by Jesus. That's not an event that comes very far after her leaving her family behind, leaving her father behind, leaving her sister behind, leaving her brother behind. And she goes into that water to be baptized and she just totally gives herself over and Jesus takes her head back into the water and, and then back again. You know, you, I saw that as a Mary Magdalene surrender moment. And I think, you know, our Clavius had the same thing that he went through too, where he, both of them met Jesus and then as soon as they met him, that was it. It was all over. It was effectively over. The ego was down for the count. It was, it was like it was on the mat, it was on the floor, and off they were going to follow Jesus. And, and, and even the time when Clavius was saying to the one apostle, and did you doubt? Did you think that he would come back? And he said, well, he said he would, but we doubted. We doubted it. And then he goes further to, to say, why, why do you follow him? And then he goes over to the, uh, what's it, the leper, and, uh, and, and ministers to the leper, and the leper, you know, goes and is clean, his skin, everything is completely clean. Uh, and off he goes, and they all witness it, and he said, that's why. Uh, it's so direct. It, the faith is there, but we have, to, we have to find that faith inside of us. You know, the ego will throw up lots of evidence for doubting. Lots and lots and lots of evidence. But, but, but Clavius, you know, he, he really, he kept the faith. And then by the end of the movie, you know, he, he was walking on his way, I think, as, as a disciple. Uh, he, he was a disciple there. He was in, even in a disciple's robe. He was not in all the armature and the, the color and with the sword and everything, you know. He had totally out, outgrown that. So that's part of your time there with Alan and also the time with Sarah is that you are actually praying and praying and opening up to be shown. You are, are walking through this and it is a, a letting go. It's like you're taking some layers off uh, you're peeling away layers in your mind um, of, of false beliefs and false concepts. And then every time you join in with us at the movie, you know, there's another rinse. You, you know, it's, we, we could come up with a movie one week called Rinsing Esther. <laughs> we watch your face every week. You're such a, a willing participant <laughs> to this rinse. You're... Uh, you're showing us all uh, it can be done with willingness. <laughs> Did you have something else? I saw you put your hand up. Maybe we can get you unmuted there. One of the things that came up for me today when I was, this whole thing with her and stuff, so beautiful, was I was starting to feel that I was losing my identity and I was scared. But then... Of course, I would talk to Alan. If I were to talk to him, he would say, well, you know, who is that? But that's what came up, that, that I'm losing my identity. Mom's happy, I'm happy. And that's, but I, I go away from there and I, I wasn't happy. So I think it's what you're saying is, it must have been the expectations. Yeah. Yeah, you have, have so much support. You have so much support. You're practicing the course. You're, you have Alan right there with you. And these movies are helping witness. And, and I know when you've written me emails, you've talked about Ramana Maharshi's teachings. And, um, and Brian actually mentioned that when we watched... Um, uh, awake the life of Yogananda he mentioned that at the end where he said actually there was a time when um, Yogananda went back to India and, and went and sat with uh, Ramana and and he st Yogananda still had some things that were stirring in his soul and uh, and Brian who followed uh, Ramana Maharshi and Yogananda 
said, finally, Ramana says to Yogananda, who suffers? <laughs> Remember that? And so that's no different than you've got Alan. You're, you don't have Ramana, but they're telling you. But now it's playing out as Alan with, with Esther. Who, suffer, who suffers? Who's the one? Who's the one that's upset at, at mom right now? You see? So it's, it's all there. It's all the ingredients, all the help you can need is given. And you're just really, like I was saying, like with Clavius, you're in a listen, follow um, situation where you're just being guided day by day, step by step, toward the kingdom of heaven within. And you're following that, that glorious guidance. And even if you seem to forget, or you seem to bl blank out for a bit about the purpose, then it comes back. This, the, the reminders are there. You, you read something in the Course, or you remember something that Ramana taught, or you, you have Alan telling you, or I'm telling you, or somebody, you know, the witnesses are there. You know, you, your, your way is set. And now it's just a matter of, of being very willing to, to listen and follow and, and walk through this. I mean, you have shared how, how uh, intense that was when your father died. It was so intense that you couldn't really even hold the thought of him dying in your mind. It was so too intense. And now, here you are getting an opportunity with Sarah to walk through that. You know, it's like Jesus is right there, he's got your hand. And he says, yeah, we can, we can look at these things together. You know, I've got you, and you're holding my hand, and, and we're walking through this. And this time, you won't be paralyzed with fear. This time, you'll remember who's got your hand, and who walks with you. And uh, I love that workbook lesson where Jesus says, who walks with me? This question can be asked a thousand times a day. He says in the workbook, <laughs> and see how friendly and happy he is. Who walks with me? This question can be asked a thousand times a day. Or if you knew who walks beside you on the way that you have chosen, fear would be impossible. And again, that's all we have to do is come back to the moment and remember who walks with us. Just one thought. Shoo, takes us back into the peace. Just one thought. We're only one prayer away from peace of mind. And that's one version of it, who, who walks with me. And Bill Thetford, you know, used the prayer, here I am, Lord, you know, which is more, it's not a question, it's more of a declaration. Oh yeah, here I am, Lord. Not interested in the distractions. Here I am, Lord. Yeah. So thank you, Esther. Thank you for your transparency. Yeah. Thanks, Esther. Next we have uh, Diana at uh, Camus Co Living. Can I mute that? Oh, David, just a sec. I'm going to put. Uh... I'll pin you. Diana, they're all tech savvy. They know how to pin pin me on the screen. There you are. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> have good teachers here. Okay. Um, David, I'm so this was amazing. Oh my god, this was um, this movie was amazing. And I've shared before that I just never I never watched movies. So all these all these shows, like this is the first time I've seen these. And I, the, the thing that stood out the most to me in this movie was um, when Claudius was guiding the disciples down into the canyon away from the Roman soldiers. And he was telling them, get low, get low. And then all of a sudden, his, uh, the assistant that he used to have when he was, when he was a, a Roman soldier, um, and now he's like with the disciples. I can't remember his name, but the assistant came up to him and he had the knife at him. And it was like, all of a sudden, it was, I, it, it went, it went quantum. The experience was just quantum. 
It was, there was no time. The, the dialogue between the two was, I wrote it down. Some of it I wrote down, no one dies today. Like, it, it, it was language from the heart. It wasn't the words, but it was how the message was being spoken. You, it, it was almost like you could hear the message in the wind kind of thing. The quantum, the quantumness that you feel in the wind. That was the eeriness of, of that experience. Like there was just, yeah, it, it was just timeless. No one dies today. No one. Go on and tell no one. It was almost like he did a reverse ego, uh, hypnotic ing on him. You know, like the like the ego possessive <laughs> hypnotism, but it was reverse. It was spirit hypnotic. No one dies today, and and this is like, right? That's right. No one dies. And you're gonna go and tell no one, right? I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> and it went just like that. It was like, oh my God, that was so beautiful. And it if, I was the, if I was the assistant and looked into your eyes as you're saying that, I, that's, I would melt too. <laughs> yeah. It's going to go down just like that. Right? That's right. That's how it's going down. <laughs> that's it. I love you, David, so uh, much. I love you too. <laughs> That's the power of God, you know, just going into that state of mind. We're totally cared for, and there, Clavius was showing us all, you know, how it's done. <laughs> uh, I love that you're seeing these movies for the first time, because that, that's the most precious thing. You know, it's like they're just quantum quantum experiences when you just get these flashes and these insights and these lessons that you know through time without your willingness and without your prayer it, it just seems to take so long and then when you're ready for it it just they come flashing through the mind healing flashes across the mind it is very quantum it's beautiful thank you Okay, uh, next we can go to Susan Jameson. Can I meet yourself there? There we go. Oh, I don't want to see me, you. Yes, there. Hi. Hi there. Hi, Susan. Hi. Wow. What a great movie. Um, yeah, I don't even know what to say, except I'm hearing an echo. Oh, I know why. Because I have my phone on, too. I've got this sound syncing going on. Don't ask. But um, I saw this film in 2016 with my second partner. And um, he was a Mexican Indian who looked very much like Yogananda, <laughs> very much. But we knew we were separating at the time. So um, it was a very emotional film when I saw it then. And it was again tonight, especially the, the scene that was the big wow scene um, where Clavius meets Jesus. And boy, the, there really are no words, but the unconditional love that seeming transmission of God that happened to Clavius was like, you know, and, and sitting here again, I remember crying then and crying tonight and just feeling, wow, isn't this our purpose? You know, just to be with Christ, with, to be with Jesus, like, like you always say, and, and to meet our brother that way, no matter who it is. But to go with that love, you know, and it's not us, it's just Holy Spirit and Jesus holding our hands and being present with people. And I was just blown away by that tonight. You know, um, yeah, it reminds me of how I know, how I wished I had been Christian 
and with my first husband, whose mother was very, very devout Catholic. And Patrick was the oldest of seven. And whenever we would visit them in Canada, all the siblings would run when Irene showed up because all she wanted to talk about was Jesus. And I said, oh, I'll go. And I would just sit with her and we would talk for hours and everybody was relieved. But I, I always walked away like, oh, you know, just to be with Jesus this way. So I'm so grateful. And I, I see Esther, I have to say, that my mother Lil's sister was Esther. So the very first retreat I ever did, and I saw Esther, we connected. <laughs> so hi. So anyway, I, I also, I love you. I love you all. And uh, yeah, it's so powerful. Yeah, just so beautiful and became so real and truly practical because you just want to love. You know, I just want to look at all of you and just, you know, love you. And I know that's who we are. We're all brothers, sisters of Christ together. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And yeah, what a beautiful, gentle Mexican, you know, that, that Jesus is so beautiful. So I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, loving. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for recounting that, that you call it the wow moment. Um, Ooh. Because when Clavius came in, you know, um, there, there was a lightness there. They were so happy to see Jesus and, and you could feel a lightness, like a, a lightness and a softness and a playfulness in the room. In fact, there was one point when uh, there was like a gentle laughter in the room. And that, that's because of the miracle. They, they weren't thinking, here we are, Jesus and the apostles, and here comes a, a Roman soldier through the door. They, that was not in their mind. You could hear the gentle laughter. It was soft. It was conversational. It was uninterrupted. And, and that reminds me of Diona talking about that scene, too, uh, where she called it the, this quantum scene, and it was like it was speaking, the wind was speaking and everything. And I have to say that that's, when I got into the Course, I just got into it following Jesus deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then something happened where suddenly I could see my happiness and my function were one and that, that I actually had dislodged my mind from, from thinking about people or situations in kind of a linear way, you know, like a, a typical linear way. I mean, I would meet people on the street or meet people in a restaurant or on a plane or a train or out walking or whatever, and it would be these huge, full, orchestrated, like revivals um, in, in a muffler shop. You know, I'm just sitting in there waiting to have my car fixed and then and I'm sitting there and I'm looking around and everybody's quiet in the Midas muffler shop and looking and then just in quiet prayer looking and then I'm having some eye contact with some of the people in the waiting room of the Midas muffler and then looking and then our eyes are like sparkling and we connect across the room and then and then it's all quiet and then all of a sudden I didn't say anything it just would be like praise God and, and then all glory to Jesus over there. And then the guy with the Midas hat on, praise God. You know, I would just be like, oh, this is cool. This is so cool. And it happened so many times. I mean, I remember at the Peace House one time, they were, they were having some kind of a party at the main town, the main street in this tiny little place called Spring Grove Village at the time. And I remember my friend Kathy and I said, well, let's, there's some kind of a festival or something going on. They're supposed to bring, bring uh, your lawn chairs and bring a cooler or something. So I, let's go. We went there. They had shut down the whole main street in this tiny little Spring Grove village. And they were having a birthday party for Jesus in the summer. And in the Rancher book, I think it says that he was actually born 
in a summer month. It's just the, they put it December 25th, but it says, and, and there it is, seven churches in this tiny, tiny little village that I lived in with this peace house, seven churches had banded together and they decided to throw a birthday party for Jesus in the middle of the summer. So we bring our lawn chairs and there's a parade, they're marching and they've got a theater, they brought in a theater act and they've got a, a Christian choir and we are totally with our little coolers and drinks and our little lawn chairs we're like watching, I'm, I'm looking at Kathy going, this is a birthday party for Jesus. I said, is it, this Course in Miracles, what do you think? Look at this. We know now we're watching a birthday party for Jesus at this tiny little village. It just happens over and over. I, one time I was in Stockholm and was walking with my friend Helena Hunison and I was, I was so happy. I was talking about Jesus, Jesus. And she said, well, we're in Stockholm now, David. She said, you know, it's not exactly the Jesus... Uh, capital of the world you know you're not gonna you're not gonna necessarily meet people or people aren't are not really going to be talking much about jesus and i said i don't know i'm just feeling it i'm just feeling it and then i turned and looked and here comes a parade down the street and people are all dressed up in the costumes and it's it's a jesus parade i said that's a jesus parade she she I mean, these are just like witnesses, you know. Even when I went to Buenos Aires one time, I was down there and I was flying around and going, and then I was driving around with some friends. And I said, what's that? It was a Jesus amusement park. No kidding. The whole amusement park was Jesus. I've had restaurants that were entirely Jesus restaurants. I was with Lisa one time. We were out, I think it was um, maybe Arizona and... And we're driving around, we pull in, there's a restaurant over there, let's go over there. We par pull in the parking lot, we go in, open the menu up, it's all Jesus. Everything. The Bible and Jesus, every single item. I'm like, look at this. It's all Jesus. And then the waitress comes up and talks about Jesus. The people are all talking about Jesus. And I'm like, this is surreal. And I said, what, what is going on here? Lisa was like, what's going on? What's going on? She'd never seen anything like it either. She grew up in a Quaker, near a Quaker community in Pennsylvania, but we'd never seen like this. And she said, oh, well, you're in the town of Snowflake. I said, okay, we're in Snowflake, and we're in a Jesus, completely Jesus restaurant in Snowflake. And she, we said, what is Snowflake? And she said, well... Years ago, there were two Mormon families, the Snows and the Flakes. And we're like, oh, but here we go. We heard the whole story of the Snows and the Flakes, found in the town, and now there's a, the Mormons, the Jesus restaurant. But there's hundreds of these kind of experiences, but I do remember, the ones I remember the most is like Deanna was talking about, where I meet a couple, a few people at a restaurant. We're in a restaurant, and all of a sudden we get into this real inspired conversation. And it's like Theona said, you could, it's almost in the wind. And I'm lit up and I've lost track of David and the people and where I'm at. And I might, be, might as well be in a boat on the Sea of Galilee because I'm fired up and, and it's just pouring through. And it's coming through with, with stories and parables, and I'm all lit up, and I'm all lit up, and, this, and I'm just totally lost track of time and space. I'm not thinking I'm in a, a public restaurant. But I'm doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And then as in the middle of the talk, I'm talking, and I look to the side, and the people on the booths are all smiling, and they're listening to the parables in a public restaurant and the whole thing. And it happened to me a number of times, but one time... I was, met this person, we, I did the whole thing in there, and then I finally got up to leave, and everybody in the restaurant just stopped and watched me leave, because they heard all the parables in the public restaurant, and they went, and I went out into the parking lot to get in my car, and I looked, and all the faces were still in the window following me in the parking lot, like, what have we beheld? What, what, are, what are we beholding here? What, hap what just happened now? But it, it's all based on listen and follow. Like once you start to merge with the purpose, then that's it. That's all she wrote. Then you, you just can just go through life 
just with a sequence of, of holy encounters. And that's the only purpose that they have. It's to inspire, to bless. There's no other purpose. Not to analyze, not to fix, not to give advice, not to cross-talk, not to... All the typical things. There's no competition, there's no... There's nothing. It's just that. And eventually you do find that that's where... That's the happiness and joy. And then you could fully appreciate this movie that was intense when you first saw it with your your Mexican Indian partner to break, even during a breakup, watching that movie, it has to be intensely beautiful. And then now you got to see the wow scene again. You can't beat that. That's miracles. That's miracle mindedness at its best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so we've got uh, Robert at the monastery. I'll mute there. Hello, David. Hi, Robert. Greetings from the monastery. <laughs> Say hi, Wow, uh, whew, wow, wonderful movie. Um, you, you mentioned that this has become the favorite Jesus movie of the, uh, the ministry, I guess, and it's, it's mine too. It's, uh, more, I, I like the way that they uh, depict Jesus in this movie. Uh, first of all, uh, Chris felt inspired to share two words uh jesus, jesus joy jesus joy <laughs> <laughs> Great. and uh i'm feeling that too <laughs> uh i have two questions uh this is such a powerful movie for uh demonstrating there's this, uh, in the principles of miracles, the tenth principle is that miracles should not be used as spectacles to induce uh, belief. It's a misunderstanding of their purpose. And, you know, these types of miracles would really induce belief in me. <laughs> and the Holy, it's been said that the Holy Spirit has a convincing job and we should always be vigilant for miracles and Holy Spirit uses miracles to convince us. And I was just kind of wondering how all this flows together. Maybe you could speak on that. And the, the second question I have is, I came in here super motivated to see this movie. I've been wanting to see it for a long time now. And I really enjoyed it and everything, but for some reason, I kept nodding off at certain times. And the only thing I can think of, I wasn't tired when I came in here, I'm not tired now. And the only thing I can think of is that it's resistance coming up at me, like somehow the ego is slipping one past, slipping one past me. And I was wondering if you have any tips just how to, I mean, I guess a disciplined mind can achieve anything, but maybe some tips how to put the ego in its place so that it doesn't keep doing this stuff to me. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Well, the first question about um, miracles should not be used as spectacles to induce belief, it, it really relates to the idea that miracles come from God and come into the mind and extend through consciousness and then radiate out and into a, a holistic perception of the world. And, and so from the ego perspective, if people even watch this movie or they actually uh, try to conceptualize it, it seemed like Jesus healed people. It seemed like in this movie he went over and and he touched and embraced uh, the leper. And the leper 
said, you're touch, you know, you're touching me like no one touches me. That was the first thing. So uh, he went there and he seemed to, to embrace him and to touch him. And, and then uh, he, the man rose up and then he, he walked off. And then we saw as he walked off at some distance, he looked back and, and his, his face, his complexion, his arm, everything had changed. The, the symbols of the leprosy were gone. And so people watch this and they go, wow, that, that was so impactful. And Jesus healed, healed the leper. But actually, this is the way that it works. When you are identified with the Christ mind and you're in the I am presence, that's very much what I talked about um, a lot, even uh, recently about Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, there's no mind and matter. There's no life, truth, substance, intelligence, and matter. It's, it's a recognition in the mind of what's real and true. It's what Jesus calls true empathy. So it wasn't like he was healing the people because when Jesus went back to Nazareth, for example, in the Bible it says Jesus went back, he visits Nazareth, and he, the Bible says there were no miracles. Hmm, that's kind of, that gets your attention. He, everywhere he goes, there's miracles, and he goes back to Nazareth, and there's no miracles. What's going on? Well, this is what's going on. When he went back to Nazareth, there was too much past associations in the mind of those that were perceiving Jesus. You know, they, they watched him grow up. They saw him entirely as a man, and not as the Messiah. In fact, they probably had some snickers. Uh, <laughs> Oh boy, yep. look who's in Nazareth now. It's Jesus. They say he's the Messiah. I watched him grow up as a little boy. You know, I, I know Jesus. He's just, he's just a guy. And there were no miracles. Because why? Because the receptivity for the miracles wasn't there. When Jesus would seem to heal somebody, you would hear things like, by your faith, you are healed, he would say. That's the key, by your faith. He's, wherever he goes, he's just in the I am presence and in the I am as God created me. He's, he's, the, he's the living word of God. It's, it's a, a state of mind. It's pure. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. He's in the state of purity. And then those that come up to him, if they have the faith, they are healed. Uh, there's even the woman who comes up behind Jesus when he's walking and, and touches the hem of his garment. Remember that parable from the Bible. The woman comes up, touches the hem of his garment from behind him, and Jesus says, who touched me? Now that's really impersonal. Who touched me? He doesn't turn around, call her by name, and say, whoa, lay, lay hands on her and everything. She's healed the instantly, instant she touches him, even though he says, who touched me? Why? Because it's totally impersonal. It's just the I am presence. And when the mind opens up, instantly it receives the healing. And that's why he says in the work, in, in the manual for teachers, he said, even upon the point of death, he's talking about like seemingly dying in the body, even upon the point of death, you could simply rise up and say, I have no need for this at all, and be healed. He's, he's clearly pointing as a state of mind. So when he says, by your faith you're healed, or who touched me, if you really watch what he's, how he's sharing, you start to get the sense that he's in a state of, of connected mind. He's connected with God. But... The ones that have the symptom removal, the ones that, that rise up from the dead, the ones that, that the lepers are healed, the, the blind that are healed, the lame that are healed, all those, it's coming from a decision. And he's telling us that it's a decision in our mind. Just like he says in Lesson 136, sickness is a decision. So you, it's a decision to shift from the wrong mind to the right mind. And that's, that's what a miracle is. And then what seems to be symptom removal is like a byproduct of that decision. If you 
choose to be healed. That's his message. If you choose to align with me and be healed, you can be. If you choose not to be healed, he says, I will wait for you. <laughs> He's very patient. He's just like the I am presence and, and it's just, it's always there. It's always an option. So that's why he was saying miracles are not used as spectacles to induce belief. Um, and that comes through in the Urantia book and it comes through in the Bible that he wasn't trying to change the form hoping to get more believers. He wasn't, you know, if, if, if he was out there trying to do spectacles in terms of things, it was already radical enough, multiplying the fishes and the, and the loaves, raising people from the dead, is what, how it was interpreted, healing people, casting out demons. That was enough. And yet, he basically was just letting the, the will of God, the Spirit, come through him in that quantum way that Diona talked about in every situation. Even that Mary Magdalene movie we just watched, remember, she just had a conversation with him about the, saying the women are too afraid. They're afraid to get baptized. They're too afraid to speak up because what it may bring on them, you know, from their husbands and their brothers and the men, you know, they're not even supposed to pray except in a synagogue. They can't even pray in their house because of the, the conditioning that's going on. Soon as she talks to Jesus about it and says, the women are too afraid, well, they walk on to the next town and the women are, are washing clothes. It's mostly women washing clothes there. And the apostles, you know, uh, they're just kind of saying, Peter and and uh, Judas and everything, well, we're not even going to stop here. Like, this is not a good stop because it's not a good place to teach. It's just a bunch of women that are washing clothes. Um, this is not, if you're doing a public speaking tour, uh, this is not, this is like a, a one on a scale of one to ten. And what does Jesus do? He takes a beeline right into the little village and then he stands there and doesn't even speak and he just keeps looking over at Mary Magdala. And then finally another apostle says, you better get over there, he's, he's looking at you. He's, the Holy Spirit's using the whole situation as a teaching device to show that women are, are completely accepted into the kingdom of heaven as much as men, that it's not a male-female thing. It has nothing to do with gender. And I, if you, some of you remember what he spoke uh, on that, I think one of his first questions was, who should we follow, our husbands or God? And he doesn't even blink, God. <laughs> he just fired. You talk about uh, blowing past cultural conditioning. He does it on the first question. And, and you see, this is exactly, he wasn't doing that as a spectacle to induce belief, but he was not believing in order of difficulty and miracles. He wasn't, he wasn't thinking that there was anything restrictive about that. It's the presence of God's love actually uses things. And I've enjoyed that over the years where I'm just kind of in an involuntary state of mind and, and the way people are brought together. You might have seen the Francis's movie, um, where Take Me Home, where uh, Jen replaces uh, Francis, Francis Romero in the kitchen, and it's a big deal. And then it, at some point, um, I'm sitting there, uh, and we're watching a movie about undoing roles in, in this little house, and I'm sitting there on the couches with these two, and Jen and Francis Romero had been kind of a very tense, situation like between the two uh one uh jen who you know she doesn't know how to cook or put together a menu she can't do toast and then francis romero's had her own kitchen her own restaurant and francis romero has been replaced <laughs> by the one who can't do toast and there's a lot of tension and friction but one day i just said well i'll show a movie it was that movie with um Catherine Zeta-Jones, no, no Reservations. I'm going to show a food movie of undoing 
um, beliefs and roles because there's a big tension in that movie. Uh, and so I showed the movie and I would pause it and, and we all were sitting around, Jen, Francis Romero and myself sitting on couches watching and I did a movie gathering to help loosen the tensions. So that was no spectacle, that was just a good old fashioned movie gathering to relieve tension and start to come back and start to feel the connection again. And they did, you saw it in the movie, they actually came to a point where they hugged each other and there was genuine, you know, connection, sisterly love that came through. So the main thing is you don't try to do spectacles to try to induce belief. Um, even though I've had people tell me in dreams that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Teresa, who was in the movie with the orange on, she told me when I visited her in Portugal, she said, oh, David, I see you in a big, it, we're, in, I'm, we're in a big stadium and you're talking and there's all these miracles. And I'm thinking, well, it sounds more like Billy Graham. Uh, than, uh, than me, but, but Jesus, you know, he wasn't even the most talkative one. Uh, Peter was more talkative than Jesus. He did more speaking and preaching uh, than Jesus. Jesus was more like the Jesus in this movie. He was just happy-go-lucky, friendly, welcoming, and he did a few teachings here and there, but, but actually Peter did most of the oratory work uh, for the apostles because Jesus was not interested in changing the world. You know, he says, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind. He was more like showing up in friendliness and happiness and kindness and demonstrating with his attitude the kingdom of heaven uh, with some words occasionally to go with it. And now the second question you had was about your resistance, um, fatigue and resistance. And I remember when I was going through some of that in the early times when I was working with the Course, when my eyes would get heavy, um, I do remember just kind of stopping and praying. And I will never forget the time when I just stopped everything. I just prayed and prayed for a while. And then I opened the book like an oracle. And when I opened the book, my eyes dropped down on the line. It said, when you find resistance high, and dedication weak, you are not ready. Do not fight yourself. I went, thank you, Jesus. Closed the book and I think I went off and had a, had a, a walk or did something fun. Uh, that's what Jesus wants us to do. Always keep in mind, relax, enjoy yourself, have some fun, and when you find yourself resisting, there's, there's a push going on in the mind, like the ego is, is trying to make a point or trying to force something. And, you know, we know even working with children, you can't force children to learn things. You have to, you have to really connect with them and they have to feel relaxed and they have to feel like an invitation in their heart before they can take something in to really practice it and live it. Um, and so we have to be that kind and gentle with ourselves. And if you, if you start to find resistance and everything, um, like if, if I ever started like feeling like really tired and when I was reading the Course, Jesus would say, say just stop and take a nap. I'd be, okay. <laughs> or, you know, or take a walk or go for a swim or, you know, that's the kind of guidance I got from Jesus. He wasn't saying, now you've only read two paragraphs and your eyelids are already heavy, David. What kind of dedication and devotion is this? No, he'd say, go take a nap. Go to have a walk. You know, it's like for him, there's no time pressure to this. There's no push. There's nothing pushing. It's the ego that's will even try to turn A Course in Miracles into a big obstacle course, you know? Push, 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 push. So I do I remember a song that uh, I, my friends Aman and Shanti, uh, they kind of went their own separate way, but I went up and met Shanti when I was up on Mercer Island in, off the coast of uh, Washington State. And she, um, she did a, played an instrument 
like a harpsichord and she played a little old concert for me, just a one, one-to-one -one concert. She sang all these songs. And then she, I did remember shortly after that, her ex-partner, Aman Ken, um, wrote a song for her called Be Gentle With Yourself. And so here it was, she was remarried to Marshall and, and they remained really close friends, her and her so-called ex. And then he sent her as a gift, Be Gentle With Yourself. One of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. And I kept playing that over and over because for me, that was for my mind, you know. It was Jesus kind of telling me, be gentle. So I would say, just, just remember that, that song, just to be real gentle with yourself. And I just know your heart. You're just, you know, you're just so much showing up uh, to live this as best you can. But, but the ego always tries to, to do some kind of a push. And that's where the, the resistance seems to rise up. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Oh, <laughs> that's a beautiful heart. <laughs> Very symmetrical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and well, we have a few hands up. David, do you want to keep on going? Yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got hands up. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, we've got uh, Vivian and Kayla. You can unmute yourself. Hi, Kayla. Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, this is my first time talking at one of these things. I'm surprisingly not quite as nervous as I thought I would be. I think, I think being in line kind of helped a little bit. Um, First of all, I just want to say it has been such an incredible journey since um, I found Living Miracles in July of this year. Um, I just feel like somehow I, I've rediscovered my path. And um, I just want to thank all of you and all of the people that show up at various things online and especially you, David, for sharing your love. Um, it's, it's really incredibly beautiful. Um, my, you've answered pretty much my question in a way, but I just wanted to also share that, um, a couple of weeks ago, I read Lesson 72, probably for the fourth or fifth time, but uh, it was very much like I hadn't ever read it before, and it kind of, my ego grabbed me and shook me around for a few days. And I think it was because I all of a sudden saw the tremendous egoic hypnotism that we are all facing and um, it really, it was shocking to me. Um, and the beautiful thing about this movie and Mary Magdalene is that there is an opposite view that I just love seeing that. And I've been watching movies for years um, applying Course in Miracles principles to them off and on. And I love this, that you, it was such a validation to me to see that you had a book <laughs> about um, being enlightened by movies, <laughs> which was just fantastic. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, so, this is my first um, movie with you, but I've listened to commentaries and, and watched um, the movies that you have had listed in your book and, they've, and that you've had commentaries for online. Um, I just, I, 
I just feel like the scenes um, that you guys have already talked about where Mary Magdalene was baptized and the two scenes in tonight's movie that we already talked about were just so powerful and impactful. And uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. We feel your heart. It's so beautiful that you could be with us and, and speak, share. Oh. Okay, next we can go to uh, Peter Block, if you want to unmute yourself there. Thank you, Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, David. How are you going? Yeah, I, you'll have to give me a bit of time today because I didn't even think I was going to share or go on today. The movie just seemed to um, really open up something in me today and um, it's been there for a long time. Uh, I think when I watched the, uh, when I did the Take Me Home retreat, I don't know, probably three months ago, roles came up. And at the time, I was doing a lot of undoing, but the biggest role was a parent. So I've got um, two young girls, and that sort of scared me. I think that, that role it really scared me. And I've been meaning to share it time after time but I keep putting it back, not sharing it. <clears throat> and there's been this roadblock, I feel, for me. I've mentioned it a couple of times. And I'm sure today that's what it, that's what it is. And during the movie, I just kept getting so upset, but I could feel that kept coming up during the movie because I'm not sharing it. And I think it's a bit of the ego coming in, telling me things about giving up that role or letting that role go. Like, I might be asked just to give it up at once and go overseas. Um, I hear, hear that in my head. And then I think spirits were telling me or I'm telling myself that it's just, un, it's okay. Just let it undo slowly and bit by bit and wait and see it happen. I've been praying to spirit to be gentle and let it happen gently. But then I hear this other voice saying, no, it's just going to happen all at once and these kids are going to be left eye. <clears throat> so yeah, I've been, as I said, I've been meaning to share it for a long time and I wasn't going to share today because I thought I couldn't. I thought I'd write to you maybe because I just thought I couldn't share it, but I decided to. <clears throat> And I've seen people like Jean on my last retreat, she shared, she was so open, so honest, and Esther's always open and honest. And I really wanted to do it. So, yeah, I just thought I'd ask you because it's, it's I've been putting it off for so long. <clears throat> and it's just something I really struggle with. I, I feel like I've undone so much, but this scares the shit out of me. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah, spirit is. Mm. Yeah, mm. thank you for sharing that because <laughs> that's that's the first step when we have something that we that we feel we have to hold on to or hide in some way. Uh, then it just seems to to like you said, it, it's very difficult. You've had a few, several very difficult weeks and months because something for some reason is like censored or kept from being shared. And then as soon as you share it, it the ease starts to come in immediately. Um, because your willingness to share it with all of us is also your willingness to just share it with the Holy Spirit and, and offer it up and say, here, you know the way. Um, and the Holy Spirit knows that, <clears throat> that the mind is, is terrified of sacrifice absolutely terrified of sacrifice and and that's why the holy spirit is so gentle and that everyone is given like an individualized version of the curriculum where it's it's brought in as just how it can be brought in because the spirit knows 
it's there's such a fear of a, of a sacrifice of loss of losing something and so I know for myself um, over the years even back in the 1990s um, I remember I had a student who who had the same thing that was coming up and she was feeling this just terror around uh, losing her children and I said well you know this is where you you can't figure it out and you can't um, you don't set the the way the plan will go you know you come back to that faith and trust that everything is gently planned by one who knows you're good and that uh, the Holy Spirit would never take away something that still seems to hold a, a, a very strong value in the mind. Uh, in fact, there's one part in the Course uh, that Jesus says something to the effect of the Holy Spirit will never take away um, something that you are still uh, holding on to. Um, and what it means is that it's like a, like a melting and an integrating process. With my friend, who my student, she kept saying, oh my gosh, I, I really feel I did just need to take a little road trip with you and go uh, out and just go to some of these places that you're going to and just open up and shine my light. But I'm, I'm just terrified of, of leaving my children, even for a little road trip, like a little teeny one. Uh, she said, there's a, there's a fear there. I'm afraid of uh, what could happen. And I said, well, just pray on it and, and then just we'll see how it goes. And then she prayed on it and then I was, I mean, I was going on two or three stops in the same state that sh where she lived. So it was, you know, very local. And she said to me one point, okay, I, I really feel it. I prayed and I'm supposed to go with you. So we went, we had like three stops. And every single stop that we stayed in, there were children. And every single stop we stayed in, the children would run up to her and, and hug her knees and kiss her like she was their mother. And it was powerful for her. Because the first time it happened, she kind of looked over at me like, are you seeing this? <laughs> like, do you believe this? And then we went on to the next one, and it happened again, and we went on to the next one, and it happened again. And I said, this is how gentle the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is gently bringing you symbols that you can relate to and that warm your heart to teach you that there's no sacrifice. And this happened also, I remember one time when I was up in, I think I was in Wisconsin with Kirsten, and she woke up in the morning and she just said to me, I don't know, I've got fear in my mind today. I, I'm just in a really, really fearful, a kind of a funky state of mind. And I don't know, I can't, I've been praying and I can't, can't get out of it. So I just prayed and I said, well, let's, let's go to this cute little town here in uh, Wisconsin. Let's go there. And we went there and as soon as we were walking in the town, I saw a Dairy Queen. And Jesus is like, take her to the Dairy Queen. It's, a, it's like a ice cream, soft ice cream place. And so I said, oh, come on, Kirsten, let's go, let's go get some ice cream. So we walk into the Dairy Queen and nobody's in there, it's, but it's open. And there's just a guy with a little red Dairy Queen DQ hat on and a little red shirt. And he looks like it's, it's, it's he loves working the Dairy Queen. He sees us come in and he's all sparkly and waiting for us to come to the counter. And so we walk up to the counter and she's in, Kirsten's in a real funky, kind of a fearful mood. I said, so I walk up to him and I'm real lighthearted and happy. And I just said to the guy, I said, I said, Kirsten's from New Zealand. And you know, she's never been in the Dairy Queen before. Well, his chest just puffed out. He was, now he was prouder than ever. His little DQ hat. So I said, so give her the, give her the whole show. Tell her what you got. You show this Kiwi what we've got up here in Wisconsin from Dairy Queen. And he's like, I will. 
So he spent the next 10 minutes. We got the blizzards and this and a cone and we got jimmies and I mean, we could put cookies and no, do the, you know, Reese's Pieces, you know. I mean, he went on for 10 minutes. And she just was smiling at the end of the 10 minutes. And then finally, she's like, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, what would you recommend? He said, well, actually, I think the best is da da da. And then she said, okay, well, give me that then. And she got it and, oh, she said, oh, she just got the biggest smile on her face. Now, that's how Jesus handles fear. <laughs> Dairy queen, ice cream. And it happened over and over with different ones I would travel with. I remember one time I was traveling with Armel in California. We were going all these stops. And the first place we stayed at, we were hosted at a home, and they made us a big, beautiful salmon dinner. And then we went to another stop hundreds of miles away. We did another gathering, and they brought, and again, the host, big salmon dinner. We go to another place, another big, beautiful salmon dinner. We go another place, and then when they came out with the salmon, I just looked at Armel, and she just got a little smile on her face, and she said, I like salmon. I said, I see this. And, and so the, Jesus is so playful. There was a time when I was traveling in... Australia, up and down the coast of Australia, doing gatherings, and this woman, Helena, was traveling with me, and she would notice that everywhere we would go, whether it was a, a house, a church, a synagogue, or whatever, that I was always completely, perfectly color-coordinated with, with the backdrop of the place where I was speaking. And she noticed this every single time. Uh, she would say she would show up, I was color coordinated, and she was not. And that started to bother her after we went to three, four, five stops along the coast of, east coast of Australia, until finally she thought, wisely, I'm just going to get up and I'm going to not dress until David dresses. And then when David dresses, I will know how I can be color coordinated. I will, I will follow how the Holy Spirit dresses David, and then I will be. And then she did it, and she was so happy. She would, she would show up and she'd go, look. And I'd say, yeah, that really does, you are really color coordinated. See, to me, it was, I was unaware. I, I'm not thinking what I should, how I should dress myself. But that just comes more in the involuntary nature, where Jesus just has so much fun He'll use ice cream, he'll use salmon, he'll use clothes. And, and in my, this student of mine, he brought, all, he brought in the children, the real huggy, squeezy, kissy children came in because he knew that she was afraid and she had a fear of that. And so he had to start to teach her very gently that the, that the symbols will not be ripped away from you. The Holy Spirit never rips away the symbols. It's just that things have to be slowly, slowly reinterpreted where you can, she felt happy, she felt, and I've had also other ones that travel with me that, that really love, miss their dog. And then we'd have like seven different dogs coming, coming at us at seven different houses. And I'd finally see the smile on their face like, oh, Holy Spirit knows I was missing my dog and then he sent in seven dogs. That's exactly how the Holy Spirit works. So there really is no sacrifice in this. It's, it's just the ego is trying to, you know, scare the mind. That's, that's what happens. Yeah, I think just what made it hard for me is I separated about three years ago and then about 18 months ago, my ex was being very abusive and her partner to my kids. And I had to go through a stage where I had to take those girls away and didn't give them back. And it got very messy and very horrible. So <laughs> I went through a very, very hard time in their life. And it just seems scary at the moment. Um, thinking about, um, I think it's more of the ego they're kicking in saying that's all going to be, they're going to be thrown to the wolves and you're going to be asked to do that. But 
I just had to express that I feel I don't, I don't believe that will happen, but it's been eating away at me that um, this thought that it might happen. Um, and the other situation is just with the role of being a parent too, I'm trying to undo that as well, looking after the children, which I saw, sort of don't want to be in, but it looks like a catch-22, like you're in it, but you sort of don't want to be in it because it takes up so much time as well. So, yeah, that's just what I'm working through at the moment. So I just thought I'd express it, but, yeah, that's all I needed to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful, Peter. I'm glad that you're sharing it because it, that's that's kind of launches the healing process because the ego always wants to use time to its advantage. You remember, it invented linear time. So it's always trying to use something from the past to project out a fearful outcome or consequence in the future, in this case with your children. And it's trying to scare the mind. Uh, it reminds me of this um, Star Trek episode called The Thaw, which I think probably I have on MWGE, but uh, where they go to this planet where the people have put themselves to sleep in a computer generated world to because it's a, a global, it's a, it's a disaster, a planetary disaster. And then when they go in to try to find out what's going on, they find out that they're, the people are in there and they're, they're very fearful. And every time one of them tries to escape or even thinks of escaping this ego generated world, then they cut, the ego cuts their head off. He, put, he has a guillotine and just, uh, slices their head off if they think about escaping the world. So I've done, it's only like a 50 minute uh, show, but I've done a whole commentary there. So in your case, the ego is just projecting out uh, a fearful scenario and because it knows it will get you, it'll bother you with that. Uh, you know, it'll say, yeah, you know, you, you just let them go and abuse, you know, you're, you could just do the same thing that you've seen them go through and, and then, then how will you feel? You see how it, it does that. And I find that happens too when people start to get even just a little body symptoms seemingly. The ego will have them with one foot in the grave. Um, they, they have a few coughs, <clears throat> cough, 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 and now they're thinking, I've got COVID and I've only got uh, two weeks to live. And this, I mean, I do talk to people. They, they really get shaken up with the slightest uh, symptom. And the ego runs it out in their mind to the worst case scenario, which is them dying. Uh, and, and so I always say, yeah, this is the oldest trick in the book. The ego playing with the time game to try to, to throw as many fearful scenarios in there as possible. So it's good that you're speaking it up because then we can join on this and you can start to feel, oh, okay, this is just, this is not a realistic fear. This is just the ego trying to play its, uh, its fear game. Hmm. Thank you, Peter. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Hazel there. Hazel, you can unmute yourself. Hello, hello, David. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hi Hazel. Hi, so, I, you know, clearly we're, we are all one mind because, you know, I can relate to everything that most things that are being shared and, and the movie that was shown was, um, was wonderful. Thank you for that. And um, I, I've been um, kind of reluctant to, to express, but um, I, I just really want to join the party. And, um, and uh, your, um, you know, your gatherings are just wonderful. And um, I just resonate with them so, so, so deeply. So I just really want to thank you for, for, um, you know, being the guide David and, and the um, the channel for all of this uh, to come through and for having been the 
the um, you know the, the 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 one that's open to to leading this this journey. And um, it, I, I also just um, want to share that, like I I've I've jumped on the Jesus bandwagon and um, like off, off, I mean it's, he, he's he's just a part of who we all are and all of humanity and there was a time in my life where I, I was a non-believer and, and um, just really doubting and questioning and and um, eventually you know the Course in Miracles came along and I was like yeah okay there's definitely something to this it's a very strong um, draw here and um, yeah, and I've had it in my possession for ever since it was published, es essentially. And I just kind of kept dabbling with it. And it was just a very powerful kind of, I shelved it and went into it and dabbled from here, uh, here and there. But when I retired last year, um, last July, that's when I, I, I did the first online retreat. And I've just kind of pretty much done every one since then. And then in, in the, at the December retreat, it was very clear. I, I heard a message. Uh, it was clearly from Jesus to, to go to Mexico. And I just kind of went, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. And, and by the end of December, I, you know, or the end of January, I, I you know, I, I was on my way down there. And, and those, those two afternoons that I spent with you and Suava and, um, you know, some of the others in the community were, where the most fun I had had in a long time, and you know, I still relish those those experiences, and um, and uh, I'm so grateful that, that you know that you actually took the time to um, join with with me. I'm just very very grateful for that, and and um, you know, it was scary for me too to reach out to you and to try and contact you, and I. Thought I would be rejected, and it just wouldn't have never come about. But since since I've come back um, for that from that month uh, in Mexico, we we put our house on the market. We sold it during March, um, a, um, April, May, and June. We were just purging and sorting and packing and storing. Uh, July and August, you know, just frantically house hunting and you know downsizing substantially and. And um, for most of um, uh, September, you know, we've 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 still been kind of moving. We've been moving into a much smaller home, and um, like we're still moving. We're still transitioning. But the um, the, uh, the Tina Tina Spalding's forty days and forty nights with Jesus were we're thirty days into that now, and. Um, um, and I, I, you know, I, I acknowledge that you're the next retreat, online retreat that you are offering is is on Jesus. So Jesus is just like first and foremost, like at the at the top of of you know of what's happening. And um, you know, I've I've recently purchased some of her books. This one here, uh, Jesus, my autobiography, is just sort of um, so deeply um, powerful. You know, it's his direct channeling through her, and um, and so I'm just, I just really want to share in the, in the celebration of, of Jesus. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for this online community, this sort of virtual community to, to, um, to share that with, because um, I'm starting to be more outspoken with it, with my daughter and with, with my partner, John. And, but, you know, I've mentioned it to, to some people and they've just kind of, you know, thought I was the work of the devil and, but others have come around and really embraced this whole 40 days and 40 nights with, with Jesus. And, and I'm, 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 so, I'm so, so pleased that, you know, that it's not me that's doing it. It's just what is being rinsed away. And so there's a constant, you know, a, a deep, deep, profound, uh, ongoing rinsing away. It's and like with what Esther's sharing and with what everybody is sharing, you know, I just acknowledge how attuned we all are with, um, um, the support that we're receiving through uh, from from Jesus through you and Tina and other um, channels that are are here to to guide us and um, so um, I would just I, I would like to be uh, of service I would like to be uh, helpful up here from you know Canada my 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 time sort of is opening up now where where i'm just 
really wanting to participate with uh, the, the Living Mir Miracles community. And, uh, you know, if there's anything that I can do to, to help in this end or, uh, you know, please, I would, I would be willing to, to, to meet and join and go deeper. So I just want to put that out. Mm, beautiful. With, 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 you know, gratitude and fear. <laughs> there is fear, but um, I'm willing just to keep pushing through that. Beautiful. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you for, for that, because that's when we were talking about the movies tonight, it was like, well, we're, we're just on a Jesus roll uh, here. And, and so it was our obvious choice for tonight. And then we've got that retreat coming up. Also, it's like, everything seems to be made very obvious. Like, if, like the last retreat, I talked about how miracles are involuntary. So I was saying to a few people today, it's kind of a, we have a kind of a Portuguese flavor. Uh, Paulinha has just come here from uh, Brazil. And I was on a call with uh, three, three Brazilians, two from Sao, Sao Paulo. They, they just moved away from that out to a mountain uh, outside of Sao Paulo, uh, and I'm get, we're talking about doing a, a retreat uh, the, the 28th and 29th of November. So it's almost like the spirit just brings us together, even in online calls, uh, just for oh, this is this will be great. Oh yeah, get to John Monday, we'll get him in there, and and Carolina Carada, and and you know we just have discussions and these uh, online uh, collaborations happen. And uh, so we're just enjoying, even with the, the Jesus uh, retreat coming up, um, we just just put out the, the flyers and everything. We had fun with that last weekend coming up with, with the title and a poem uh, from our friend Sabine in Germany. And, and so it is a, a kind of a collaborative vibe Miracles are collaborative. And then we're just having that, uh, it's a Jesus party. It's an ongoing <laughs> Jesus party. So it's great. And I have heard a couple people have been doing the 40 day, 40 nights, and they've been sharing with me and, and very much enjoying it. And uh, this, this whole uh, event coming tonight, you know, was based on our poll and then, you know, just coming up praying and get the, getting the movie that really suited the, the poll. So thank you for being with us and, and thank you for your willingness. And we'll, we'll keep you in mind. If there's any way that uh, comes to mind, we're inspired by, we'll, we'll be in contact with you. And, and in terms of you going through the, the big shifts this summer now and into the fall with uh, a new house or, or with packing, moving, traveling, you've been doing a lot of that. And now downsizing, uh, major uh, downsizing. Maybe you could watch, if you haven't seen it already, the Matt Damon movie, isn't it? Downsize, downsizing, or downsize. If you've, that was funny. You know, him and his, his partner are going to uh, retire and shrink their bodies and all their possessions and everything down into a tiny, tiny downsize. And then she gets cold feet and so she's full size and and he goes through the whole procedure and he's downsized Matt Damon and then oh boy does that bring up all of his emotions <laughs> when he's this teeny teeny little in this teeny little house and so but sometimes that's the way Jesus is is very playful see a funny movie uh, that seems to have some of the same themes but you know, it's just, it's, we keep things light. So I feel it, I feel you're enjoying it. And I did enjoy your visit down here, I, coming to the mall with me and with Svava and all the, and moving around, meeting all the people, that was fun. Those were the days, my friends, pre-pandemic <laughs> days, my friend. I've been in the same house now for eight, eight months <laughs> and a day, <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it is what it is, I guess, but uh, I, I get out, they do let me out of the house uh, 
Ken keeps the car in shape and then I get to take a three minute ride and, you know, it's kind of like a, the Truman Show or something, but it's surreal, but it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I've traveled for so many years and now uh, I'm a homebody, uh, but homebody for Jesus. So, uh, so we just flow with it, you know, we just flow with it, but thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, we have our last hand up from uh, Stephen, so you can unmute yourself there. Hey, thank you. Um, I'll be really quick here, David. This is really fun. I've got these two um, CD cases that I keep in, in my office. I just love them, having them out because they're just, in my mind, these, this is the power couple right here. we got to get Clavius and Mary together. Uh, like Mary and Claudia sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. And just, boy, these things just are in, so impactful and so fun to watch. I think I want to see the sequel where we have Claudia walking in the desert and then Mary's giving the message and then they, they meet. And then where they meet is in my mind. So thank you. These are just tremendous. <laughs> um, <laughs> just a lot of fun. But I just watch them over and over and just more stuff comes through. And I thought, yeah, this, this, these are sitting out. I'm going to watch these and just have them there in my mind. But what a couple of things that, that caught me talked uh, earlier, uh, a lot of people talked about the wow moment, you know, that, that beautiful moment. But And one of the scenes for me is when he, the close-up of dropping of the sword. And boy, that's just a relinquishment of the attack thought. I, I, I love that. And I had a relationship in my life where the competition became who can drop the sword first. And in my mind, that was, that was the competition of, of practicing whenever that challenge comes up or the wannabe right or that yeah, attack thoughts, who can drop the sword first? And then what a shift that, that, that happens. What I loved about that scene was it was bookend uh, it led right into the scene where he, he was talked about earlier where he, he's leading him, he's following him, and he says, no, there, no, one, no, no one's going to die today. There'll be no one die today. And that was his day without death. And he had talked about that earlier with Pontius Pilate in, 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 the, in the tub. Of, he longed for a day without death. And then again at the end when he's talking with Jesus, and Jesus said, certainty, peace, uh, a day without death perhaps. And, and how that was so... Like, yes, we want that day without death, that, that, that um, decision for the atonement. And, and, and that's, that's the key and how that all was pulled together. And then during that last scene, somebody's out there preaching about the path of the sword or the path of love. And I just like how that all came together. And just what a visual that is for me of that, that close up of the really letting the sword drop the, in, my, in my defenselessness, my, my safety lies, and how beautiful, beautiful that is. Another scene that really I, I love is when he's inquiring of the disciples. And, and, and it's almost like he wants to, in a comedy kind of way, will you bring me a blind woman? And, and so here's Miriam. And, and he, and I noticed, and I, and I focused in on, on, a, on a previous watching of he's using that plant. And I thought, okay, this is intentional. What, what's going on with this plant? And he's using it, and it's a rosemary. And I thought, oh, this is great, because here's the hourglass. And, and in one scene when Miriam is talking about how um, he loved her and, and he lifted her up, if you look closely, it's, it's um, framed. That scene is framed by the hourglass and by the rosemary. And I just look at the rose, and Mary is the symbol of innocence. And that's it. And they used it back then. I, I researched it because I was just curious. Why is that in there? Why is he using that to clean his hands? And it's the only thing they could get rid of the stench of death. They could it, clean, it, it got rid of that stench of death. And there you got the time dream, the dream. And there's the choice. For me, there's the choice. Do you want the innocence? Do you want the rose? Do you want Mary, the, the virgin, the symbol of the innocent mind? Or do you want time, the dream of death? And, in, in, and just how they frame that. But there was just so much other good stuff in here, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that because the evenings run, run on here. But, but, man, we're just having a Jesus fest, and I just want to see these, this power couple get together. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but thank you, David. This is just lots of good stuff um, uh, popping off in my mind and, and pulling me in um, just to say, okay, I, the, the juxtaposition there between the choice is just wonderfully clear. So thank beautiful, you. beautiful. Yeah, we're... It's interesting to see. We'll just watch how this 
Jesus party plays out. I think it was about two or three weeks ago. I was I was just sitting there praying, and then I heard go to Google. So I got my phone, and I heard type in on Google two words, uh, the Christ. So I'm like, okay. So I click it, and then dun 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 dun. The Passion of the Christ, um, Mel Gibson's movie comes up, and I don't know if you remember that one. That was a bloody mess. But uh, then it said right away, it said Mel Gibson uh, in the writing stage planning a new movie. And I said, what? It just said, it was just days old. I said, what? And it was like, oh yeah, they're working on a new Jesus movie in which the movie begins with the resurrection of Jesus. It goes beyond this one. This one began with the crucifixion, which broke the mold of a Jesus movie that starts with the crucifixion. And it was beautifully played by Clavius. He really showed, they showed us the whole thing. But, but imagine a movie that begins with the resurrection. Now there is a, now that is not a reflection of our mind. So, that's why with this Jesus party, we just never know how it's going to go, but that could be quite an interesting movie if it starts with the resurrection, because it's going to have to have all kinds of teachings and miracles and who knows what all. I mean, I don't know where they'll get call on the, for the writing of it, because the other movies, it was like you sit there for like two and a half hours or six hours, and then you're usually just peel me off of the chair, and then, boom, I'm with you always, even to the end of time. What? It's over? <laughs> Is that all I got? I mean, I remember watching Passion of the Christ, and uh, I was in a movie theater, and my mother was sitting next to me, and she's, you know, Christian, and so when they were whipping Jesus, like whipping, whipping, and the blood just started just splattering. You know, it was like this splattering. And she was sitting next to me during those, those kind of splattering blood scenes, and I remember her ah, just gasping. Ah, but that each swip, ah, ah, you know, and I, I thought, hmm. So I just was kind of watching the whole movie, and then I was saying, well, there's probably going to be a really exhilarating miracle moment for this movie, and there sure was. The last scene in the movie, when, when Jesus rises up from the, from the grave, sits up, Whoosh! I got a whoosh of joy. I said, "Thank you, Mel." I got <laughs> I had to just be patient for like two hours. You know, splatter, splatter, splatter. Whoosh! So, you know, now if the movie starts with the resurrection, that sounds really good. That is skipping over <laughs> everything: virgin birth, this trials, temptations, teachings, crucifixion. Oh, we start with the resurrection. So, there you go. You, I see you've got something else to, to share. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. No, I just it brought up today, I had a couple of wonderful experiences. I, I drove from Phoenix to Tucson because uh, the Apple store in Tucson had the only remaining um, Mac computer desktop in the state of Arizona, and I happened to need, need one. I thought, oh, road trip. I'll just head down and pick it up and have a nice drive. And, and, and on, on my way back, there, I just noticed things were starting to pop, and I was working on something in my mind, was uh, some kind of problem, and I hadn't, hadn't quite turned it over. And then the moment I turned it over, and I, I thought, ah, oh, this is what I'm, this is what's going on. Then, then my, I, I looked to my right, something just turned my head to my right, and it was a, a one of those giant billboards, Christ is Alive. I mean, a big, massive billboard. Now, I, I, I don't go looking for those things. And so I just laughed and I said, yeah, okay, yeah, right on. Of course, once, once my mind got vertical and I, I saw the problem as it is, not how I set it up, and there was that big, massive billboard. Um, so that was just, that was a fun experience. And I even got to use the word penis in a salon. I, I went to get a, a pedicure and, and, and the ladies in there and I was just waiting my turn and I'm, we're talk, talking about what, what happiness is. And I said, you sure do work a lot. I see you in here all the time. And, and she says, oh yeah, I, I'm working a lot. I'd like to earn a lot of money. And, and I said, well, how much money do you think you need to be happy? And, and she says, oh, 50 million or something like that. And so we're in a conversation with two or three of us, David, and the lady is getting her toes scrubbed on and, and you know, what, what's happiness. And we're talking about, oh, this doesn't make you happy, but you really don't know that until you 
wandered around for a while to know that. And then I was, I brought up the movie Hector and the, um, uh, the search for happiness. And in that movie, you know, where they have that funny line where that, that French lady in her accent says, I want a penis. And, and, and I, I shared that with them and they just were rolling. And I didn't know, I, I, I knew the lady had just come in and sat down and caught that part of the conversation, but she didn't know about the rest of the conversation. So here's just this goofy guy talking about how he wants, how he wants a penis. And then I had to explain it to her, but it was fun. It was all in good fun. And it was just a, a fantastic, like one of those moments where, man, it just, the parables are running through and, and being able to share different movies and what happiness really is and how do we know and, and how do we get aligned with that. But anyway, it was just a fun day, but thanks for indulging. That. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we heard last week that Yogananda had to turn to his head to, to see his guru, and you turned your head driving across Arizona to see your guru. Christ is alive. <laughs> so at, at that point, I think we'll wrap it up. <laughs> it's been a pretty long day. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and we love you, and we, we always look forward to you, and thanks for uh, putting your votes on the poll. So we, we just really follow that every week. We just uh, see what's up in your mind and what, what topics you would really love to uh, hear some more on. So thank you for participating in that. And look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Good night. Good afternoon, good evening, good night. For Peter in Australia, good morning. Good day, mate. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks, everyone.